This lecture will be Bezrat Hashem Lerfua, David Ben Simcha Levi, David Ben Yafa, Noah Bad Dorit, and Leilu Nishmat Lev Ben Ephraim Yosef, Rivka Bad Chaviva, that's Lachat Achayalim and Shikru Achatufim, Leilu Nishmat Dvora Bad Mercedes, that's Lachat Pinchas Ben Yochai, and uh, also also, this uh, will be, uh, this lecture also sponsor, uh, sponsor also for the Neshamot of Roda, Bats, Natan, Daniel Ben Natan, and Arthur Ben Avram Avinu. Also for Atzlacha in Shiduchim, Leshai Ben Yonatan. Tov. Baruch Hashem, on Shabbat we finished Sefer uh, Bereshit. We're going to start the next Shabbat, Sefer Shmot, the book of Exodus. We finish with the, with the pass of Yaakov Avinu. And uh, before I get into the topic tonight, I don't know if you listen to the news today. Yeah, I've been telling you for more than 20 years, if somebody asks you, who is the biggest enemy of the Jewish nation? The biggest. Some of you would say Hamas. Some of you would say Hezbollah, Jihad, anti-Semites of Europe. There's a lot of enemies. But the answer is, the biggest enemy we ever had that caused the biggest damage to the nation of Israel is the Israeli Supreme Court. No one more evil than them and no, more, no one is more wicked than them. It's 15 evil, wicked judges that hate God very much, hate Torah, hate religion. Everything that God hates, they love, and everything he loves, they hate. That's, there's no other way to define this characters. Today, they officially kidnapped Israel from the 10 million Israelis that lives in Israel, officially. That's it. It's now became a dictatorship. They took over Israel. It's a coup. It's a revolution. That's it. They passed a law today that they can make any law they want. They overcome the constitution. It's based on their logic. That's it. From now on, every one of these evil, rotten, imach shimam, these judges, they can say, it's lo savir be'enai. It's not logical in my eyes. I overrule this law. I dismiss this law. I cancel this law. I do, basically, I do whatever I want. Every one of them. So from now on, there's no point of making an election in Israel. It's a waste of time to, ele to vote. There's no point of voting. Until now, they did whatever they wanted in Israel for the last 40 years. But now they made it official law. That's the official law now. That from now on, they decide whatever they want, regardless of what's written in the Constitution. They can cancel Kuke Esod, meaning they can actually cancel laws of the Constitution based on what they feel. And of course, of course, they always take the side which is against the religion. They always take the side that is against, against the Torah, against God. They always poor gays. Just a few days ago, they passed a law that the gays can adopt kids, which is a disaster for those kids. Sodom and Gomorrah laws, they causing so many of our soldiers to die because when Hashem see that the people of Israel do not protest against these 15 evil, wicked people and let them do whatever they want and everyone sits at home and do nothing about it, we're going to die for it. It's no joke. Hundreds and thousands of Israelis are going to die because of this Supreme Court, as, as in addition to all those thousands who already died because of them. They are the reason that people are dying. They turned Israel to a sodomized country. So, this is the bad news. A few days ago, the head of the Hezbollah, Nasrallah Imachshimo, 
gave a speech. What does he say in the speech? Well, exactly what I've been telling you for 20 years, more than 20 years. He say, we are lucky, he say, Nasrallah, we are lucky that our enemies, the Israelis, are so dumb. We are lucky that they are so dumb. Their media is doing the job for us. They making the people of Israel weak. They destroy their mental, mental uh, level. They do the job for us. We are lucky that we deal with such stupid enemies. <laughs> of course, it's 100% right. Who destroys us? This media, this lefty liberal media. This is a cancer in the heart of our nation. Cancer that already took off every organ of the body. So basically, the government's a bunch of puppets. There's nothing they can do from now on. That's it. Any law they pass, these 15 wicked, evil people, they gather together, dismiss, 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 finished. No point of voting. What's the point of wasting your time? Going, waiting online. <laughs> it doesn't matter which government you're going to have. They are the government. It's not an exaggeration what I tell you. As of today, Israel is a dictatorship, officially. It was a dictatorship for the last 40 years. Don't get me wrong. It was already. They made up all the rules. But as of today, that became the new law, officially. No one can do anything about it. There's nothing he can do. The government wanted to pass some laws that they have no right to interfere with politics and with war and with religion and with Judaism, things that does not belong in court. But they saw it coming, so they tricked us. They passed a law before that the government it's not relevant. You understand? So the only solution right now is if a million Israelis will come and destroy 100% the Supreme Court, will not leave anything left from it. And then they realize that their end is coming, they will run out of Israel, and that's when you save Israel. And if not, we're only going to become worse and worse until Hashem would leave nothing left from us. Because this is what's happened when Hashem sees that the people don't care. Why should he care? Someone doesn't want to help himself. You should help someone who doesn't want to help himself. If someone is sick and a doctor is offering him a free treatment, just get to my office. I'll take care of you. I'll make an operation. I'll clean what needs to be cleaned. And he doesn't want to come. No. He's too lazy to travel to the doctor's office. Who is to, to blame? The doctor? Or the, 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 the stupid patient. The stupid patient doesn't come. Why should the doctor care? What, the doctor has to go to his house? No. Same thing over here. Hashem see the people indifferent. They call. They hate the situation, but they do nothing about it. You see, in an Arab country, you have two million people in the, in the middle of the... blowing up the country right now. Nobody will, be, nobody will allow such thing. In every normal country. But it is what it is. One thing, one good thing happened also today, after getting such a horrible news, that finally the Israeli government decided that no more Palestinians will work in Israel. They're going to bring tens of thousands of Indian workers and Chinese and from Sri Lanka, from about five or six countries. So Israel from now on will be like Dubai. You know, when you go to Dubai, every worker is almost an Indian, I don't know, some Chinese maybe. This is how Israel is going to be. I'm not so happy about it, even though I gave this idea to some of the people in the government that it must be done. Believe it or not, the secular people of the government agree with me. The one who went behind my back trying to make it not happen is the Sephardi religious party, Shas. They have two to three mandates, two to three vo votes they get from the Arabs. The Arabs vote for Shas. They make deals with them. We will take care of your Arab villages, we will take care of your religion, we will defend your religion in order for you to vote for us. We will help you, we'll get you all kinds of budgets. This is politics. They know they want to slaughter us. They know they declare they won't rest until they kill us all, but they don't care. They would make deals with them under the table to get two to three seats in the Knesset 
Why? The more people you have sitting in the government, the more money you get from the budget, the annual budget of the government. It's very good politics. So I said that to one of the ministers over there, I told him, I have someone that can get you right away 30,000 Indian workers. This I told him almost two months ago. Almost two months ago. In the meantime, all the buildings in Israel are all frozen. Nothing has been built for two months. We lost billions of dollars already in the last two months. So I told him, I, in one phone call, I can arrange for you 30,000 Indian workers for 1,000 shekel a month. It's less than $300 a month. Arabs charge it for two days. Arab worker in construction, he charge between five to 800 shekel a day. They work from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m., that's it. An Indian worker will work for you in buildings from morning to night the entire month for less than $300. That's what they pay them in Dubai, 1,000 shekel. An hour later, I hear on the news, Anyone who say that we should get rid of the Arab workers is nothing but a racist. An hour later, after I spoke to him on the phone, instead of telling me, yeah, yeah, of course, they're killing us. They're spying on us. They gave all the information to the Hamas because the Hamas came with a list of every house. They knew the owner of every house. They knew how many bedrooms there are there. They knew about the security system. They knew where the laptops are, where the safes are. They stole confidential information from a lot of army officers. They knew in each building, in each house, what, what important sensitive information there is to steal about Israel, about the army, about who knows what else. Who knows what else they got? Remember, this is people, generals from the army, a lot of them are lefties that live in those kibbutzim. Big generals, could be spies, could be Mossad agents, people that work with the CIA, who knows what information they got? All the information they got from the Arab workers. They're all part of the Hamas. Who are these Arab workers that come from Gaza to work? Are they any different? They're not different. So instead of telling me, of course, we can never afford to let them in. They're killing us. What's the point? They're gonna come to work in our house and the next day they'll slaughter our children? What does he do? Run to the media and say it's nothing but racism. Why does why it's racism? We, we care about the race? When we say we don't want Arab workers, it's because they are Arabs? No, it's because they're murdering us. If tomorrow the Indians that will come will also start murdering us, we will speak against the Indians. And if it will be the Chinese that murder us, we'll speak against the Chinese. It's nothing personal against Arabs. It's just, you, you, you want to murder us or you want to let us live? You want to let us live, we'll give you parnasa, you make a living. You want us dead, we don't want you in our homes. <laughs> what does it have to do with racism? But it is what it is. Okay, so now I guess they didn't have a choice because so many of the people in the government don't want, do not want to let them in. Why? Because the people don't want them in. The builders, so I'm not taking them, I'm sorry. They saw that for two months nothing is happening. The builders are not agreeing to accept Palestinian workers. And their government lose fortune. Because remember, every building that they finish, they sell apartments. Every apartment they make between 6 and 10% on every apartment that is sold. Do you understand? If you buy a $2 million apartment, the government will get $200,000 in the closing, it's not like here, here I think it's much less. It's very, very expensive. If you are not an Israeli citizen, you pay 10%, mas knia. If you are an Israeli and it's your first apartment, you pay 6%. If it's second apartment, you already own one, you buy another one for investment, 8%. And if you're not an Israeli citizen, you pay 10%, 10%. Some Americans, they wanted to buy apartments. They don't want to pay 10%. Especially the Americans, they buy expensive apartments in Jerusalem, in Mamila, it can be $10 million. $10 million, you have to pay $2 million when you buy the house to the government, $2 million. What do they do? They make their kids Israeli citizens. Every Jew can become a citizen. But there is a contradiction here. Why? Because when Americans want to become Israeli citizen, they give them hell if they are religious. If they are secular, 
immediately, within three months, they make them citizen. But if they see that they are religious, they don't want religious people to make aliyah. So they give them a lot of problems. Who's your mother? How do we know she's Jewish? Stop, they care about Jewish. They bring goim non-stop every day. So they don't want religious people. It's a, it's a command from the top of the pyramid. They don't want religious people. However, there is a trick to trick them. They actually trick themselves. When you send your kids to yeshivot, if one of the parents is Israeli, they want to force you to become a citizen. All of a sudden, they want you to be a citizen. Why? Because they want to take you to the army. Why they want? Let's see, one of the parents, the father or the mother is Israeli, and the other one is American. When the kid goes to Israel, as soon as they find out that one of the parents is Israeli, they don't extend his student visa. If both parents are Americans, okay, take a student visa. No problem. We make money out after all that you're in Israel, you buy things, you pay sales tax 15% for everything you buy, and American kids spend a lot. So it's good for them. But if they find out one of the parents is Israeli, immediately they begin to pressure him to become a citizen. Why? They don't want him to be a student. They want him to be a citizen. Because once he's a citizen, they're going to try to force him to go into the army. That's what they think. Of course, no one agreed to do it. American kids are not going to stay in Israel to go to the army. Unfortunately, I want you to know there's more than 500 Israeli soldiers died from October 7. In the massacre, you had about 300 and something. And from then, another 170, 180. So together, more than 500 soldiers died, male and female. Many of those soldiers were guys that used to be Haredim, left the religion, became secular, and went to the army. Dozens, dozens of them did not make it to age 20. They were Bahurei Shivot, they left the Torah, and Hashem killed them all, unfortunately. That's their bad end. They didn't have this world, and who knows if they have Olam Abba, these people. They became Halalei Shabbat, became secular. Some of them made tattoos. Once a person leaves Hashem, there is no limit to how much he can sink. Do you know how many former religious boys and girls became drug addicts? Do you know how many of them died from fentanyl? Here, around here in Queens, in Brooklyn, in Monsey, Lakewood, in Jersey. You know how many died from drugs? You have no idea what's happening. You cannot even imagine the number. And there's, nobody knows what to do. You want to put efforts to save people's lives. But when you know the statistic is 98% against you, you're going to put all your efforts and you fail again and again and again and again. You may ask, but what's the difference? You speak to secular people, some of them become religious, but the majority don't. I wish we had 100% success. Every Jew I speak to become right away Shomer Shabbat. I wish, it's a dream. Not even half become Shomer Shabbat. So the question is, why are you putting the efforts again and again and again and again and again? And in the end, two out of ten become religious after so much effort. Eight, you wasted your time. Same thing over here in the hospital. You bring a hundred drug addicts, you put so much time and money and care and nurses and doctors into them, two get saved, 98 dies. Why putting so much effort? Just give up on the whole hundred. It's not worth it. You are paying 50 times more for each patient. Remember, because you're putting efforts in 100. And in the end, you save two. But the 98 people that you work on cost fortune. You do not know who you're going to save. You save two out of 100. But 98% cost billions of dollars to the government. Billions of dollars. And in the end, they save 2%. 3% maybe if you're lucky. So when it comes to physical body, to save bodies, that's a very good point to consider. 
Do you want to spend billions of dollars to save 2% of the sick people, drug addicts? That's, that's a good question. The general rule is to save life. When it comes to save someone's life, you don't look at how much money it costs. Every parent will tell you that. If a parent work 40 years and in the end they save $10 million, working like a slave, I don't know, at the garage, mechanic, winter, summer, working until late every night, and then he has a child that is sick and he needs a special treatment that will cost $10 million. Four years of work. A normal parents, right away, would agree to pay it, to save life. So we see that when it comes to money, money is the last thing in the list. You're trying to first save life. So obviously it's a, it's a, very, it's a very big dilemma. But the answer is pretty clear. But when it comes to safe souls, there is something that it's much, much more interesting than when, you come, when it comes to safe body. i teach you the trick. If you speak for hours with a secular Jew, for hours, and in the end he did not become religious, he stayed the way he is. That's it. Went back to Bimchal and Shabbat, everything the same. You may say, okay, the same thing. I speak to 100, 10 to 20 become religious, 80 goes back to their bad ways. I, I wasted 80% of my time and my money on people, which in the end, nothing happened with them. Isn't it the same? I mean, it's not the same numbers, 98 to 2 or 80 to 20. Obviously, it's a different ratio. But still, what if it was only 2% get saved? Let's say, let's make the same scenario. Two out of 100, you save them from drugs and they go back to, to live. Two out of a hundred, you make them buy late tshuva. Same ratio. Is it the same case, same dilemma, or it's different? What do you think? Different. Completely different. You know why? When you try to save someone's life and he died in the end, the patient died. It's a, a total, the mission failed. There's no success here. You lost money, you lost time, and you lost the patient. You cannot come with some comfort. What are you going to say? Oh, at least we tried. No, if that's a comfort, fine. But there's a total failure. Like they say in Israel, The Israeli genius doctors, they ever say, the operation went well, but the patient died. How exactly it went well? Meaning it went by the book. We didn't mess up. There are things in that, it's not in our end. God decided that they'll die. But of course, the doctors won't say the word God. It's forbidden. So they will say nature decided that they will die. There's things that it's not in our hand. When you save two out of a hundred, you save their souls, and 98 stay secular, you may come and say it's the same exact dilemma. The answer is no. Why it's not? Because there is a rule by Hashem. Every Jew is born with a ticket to the next world. Kol Israel yesh lahem chelak la'olam haba. That's what's written in the Mishnah in Masechet Sanhedrin. We say it in Pirkei Avot Elat. Kol Israel yesh lahem chelak la'olam haba. Shneemar v'amech kulan tzadikim la'olam yirshu aretz netzer matai maasei adai leitpair. Meaning Hashem is bragging about the fact that every one of his children, the Jewish nation, is born with a share to the world to come. What about the Goyim? The righteous Gentile, what about them? Do they have a share to the world to come? So I don't want people to get confused. There are two steps past this life. One is heaven. There is heaven, hell, kafakela, all these things. And there is one final destination that it's called Olam Abba, a whole different world. This will be in the end, in the end, after Messiah, after uh, resurrection of the dead, after everything. When we talk about Olam Abba, we talk about the final destinations of the soul. Once this world will not exist anymore, that's it. It's not going to be a physical world. No more galaxies, no more sun, no more moon, no more nothing. No more material, that's it. Going back to the way it was before Hashem created the world. That's called Olam Abba. This was prepared only for the children of Hashem, the Jewish nation. However, 
There is another great level. Once we die, we either go to heaven, if we're righteous, or we go to one of the seven sections of hell for X amount of time until we get clean, and then we go to heaven after that. Or we come back in reincarnation, Jews and non-Jews, reincarnation. Or we can come back in Down syndrome or autistic, that's Jews and non-Jews. Or we can come back reincarnation, raw material, Jews and non-Jews. Reincarnation in animals, Jews and non-Jews. Reincarnations in plants, flowers, fruits, vegetables, Jews and non-Jews. Heaven and hell, Jews and non-Jews. Basically, almost everything the same except the final destination, Olam Abba, the next world. The next world is only for the nation of Israel. Call Israel, it's written, not the rest of the world. All Israel is a part of the world. They have a share to the world to come. What happened if a Jew died in the Shabbat? The Torah said that Hashem promised to cut that soul from the afterlife. It's guaranteed to cut. It's written 12 times in the book of Hashem. If Hashem wants to give that Jew another chance and he sends him back in reincarnation, which is all of us, we're still in reincarnations, as you can see. That means Hashem didn't cut him yet, even though he died in Halal Shabbat. Maybe he had some good merits, maybe he was giving a lot of donations, maybe he committed, if he did other good mitzvot, good deeds. Hashem didn't want to waste such a person that had 30, 40 percent good deeds. Yes, in Halal Shabbat, and he did a lot of other bad things, but he also did some good things. So what does Hashem do? If Hashem gave up on him, that means he decided that he has no share to the world to come. That's when Hashem pays him in this world for 10, 20, 30, 40 years, wealth, success, power, whatever you want to call it. Pays him his share and that's it. He's done with him, he has no share to the world to come, he lost it. If Hashem did not give up on him and he dies, he can send him back in a new baby for another life term. If it will fix, maybe this time it will die Shomer Shabbat. If it will die again Halal Shabbat, after X amount of times, the chances are going to finish. It's not going to stay forever. Once a person that Hashem decided that he, has, he lost his share to the world to come, this share has to go to someone. This share exists. It's like a stock. Someone on that stock. You have a stock in Olam Abba. Reuven, Yitzchak, Moshe, Sarah, Rivka, everyone has it. They're born with a stock. You inherit it. Once you have a Jewish mother, you have a Jewish soul. Once you came back to the world, you come with a ticket. Problem is that the ticket has a list of conditions. In order for you to get your share, you have to follow the conditions. Just like in every banking contract. They're willing to give you, to let you to invest, but there are contracts. If you violate the contract, they throw you out. You lose all your rights. One of the main things in a contract, it must be Shomer Shabbat. Otherwise, you lose your Jewish status. And if you're not Jewish, you have no shelter world to come, because this was only Israel. Once you died as a non-Jew, because you were Mechalel Shabbat, you violated your Judaism, you lost your shelter to the world to come. But who will get that stock? The person that did the most to save that Jew. The person that did everything he can to make this Jew, Shomer Shabbat, spoke to him, convinced him, threatened him, showed him what's written about Mechalele Shabbat, gave him a CD, gave him a USB, gave him a book, invited him for Shabbat to see what Shabbat is. After all the effort, it did not work. If that person lost his share, who gets the share? The one who tried to save him. That's why it's different when you try to save the life of someone and he died. You get nothing. Nothing, besides frustration. You try to save him, but he died. You get nothing. But here, it's different because you try to save him. If he died, meaning spiritually, you get his inheritance which is shared to the life of eternity. 
So now your share is much better than the one you had before. Until now you had one stock, now you have two. What happens if you try to save 10? You have 10 shares. If you try to save 100, you have 100 shares. You can live here 70, 80, 90 years, you can have tens of thousands of shares. <laughs> You're a very lucky person. So over here, when trying to save souls, it's a no-lose situation. You can never lose. You can never lose. There's no such thing, waste of time or waste of money. There's no such thing. Even if the person just heard the lecture that you shared with him, you sent him a link, and you heard it for an hour or two hours, whatever it was, and nothing happened, he went back right away to be the same way he was. The two hours that he listened, that's already 120,000 mitzvot went to your account. How could you lose? What did it cost you to send the link? You send it to 50 people on your group, five, six watched, you right there, got a million mitzvot for free, pressing few buttons. It's a very, very good investment. So we got the point, but that's not what I wanted to talk about. We know that if you remember the last year that I gave, first of all, I have two, I had, Baruch Hashem, two very good lectures in LA, in Beverly Hills, and one in a valley. For whatever reason, I don't know what the mind of the people here, because then they like the Monday night lecture and the Tuesday night lecture. They see a lecture in LA, they assume maybe it's not good. No, it's much better than these lectures. Much better. Especially, you know, the, the, those two, they were very good. Why they were very good? Because there were hundreds of people in the audience. When you have hundreds of people, it gives the speaker more siyata dishmaya, more help from Hashem. When hardly anyone comes, first of all, he doesn't feel desire to speak. So when you do something with no cheshek, with no desire, it's right away 50%, not as good. Just like everything else in life. If a woman cooks for her husband a meal, but she's not in a mood today, I don't have to tell you how the meal will be, you know? But if she's happy, he treats her nice, she feel obligated to, you know, take care of him tonight, she puts her neshama into the food, gets the best thing, clean well, cut well, put extra effort, set up the table better, special dessert, why? She's in a mood, not in a mood, you know? Same thing when you come to give a speech. You're in the mood or you're not in the mood? Okay. Next thing is that the audience has a lot of people. It's enough that few of them have the merit to hear a very good, inspiring lecture. For that, Hashem ignite the speaker, for them. For them. It's their schut. Once they have a schut, Hashem makes the lecture goes very well. If no one in the audience has schut, oh, it doesn't come so great. So you should know, you don't want to miss those lectures. Okay, so last lecture we gave in New York, and that was last Tuesday. I spoke about ya Yaakov standing in front of Paro and complained about his hard life, remember? And Hashem was upset. You have a, a world to come, is waiting for you in the highest level. And you complain to this wicked king, Paro, the wicked Paro. You complain to him how hard your life was. Plus, Dina, she was kidnapped. I brought her back to you. She could have been dead. Yosef was kidnapped. I brought him back to you. In the end, it wasn't so bad. But what do you mean you brought him back to him? Dina, you brought her back to me after her life is destroyed. Yosef, I haven't seen him for so many years. By the time I see him now, he's, oh, he was a teenager. Now I lost all these years with him. Who was going to pay me for these years? 34 years I was running away from Esav. The love of my life died at age 36. You brought her back to me? No. She was supposed to live another 50 to 100 years. What happened in the end? I lost her. Meaning Yaakov has a claim. Even though he has a claim, Hashem was very, very upset from, from Yaakov complaining. From here we see no one is allowed to complain. Because we don't have a case. He had a case. 
Here the case and Hashem was upset with him. We don't have even 1% of his case. We dare to complain? The, an the answer is absolutely not. That's where we left last time. I want to elaborate a little bit more about this topic because it relates to us every hour of our life. These are things, Dvarim Berumo Shel Olam. Dvarim Berumo Shel Olam. Vayomer Yaakov El Paro, Me'at Ve'raim Ayu Shnei Mechayai. My life was short and bad. They didn't reach the life of my father. Yitzchak lived 180 years. Avraham lived 175. He was supposed to live 180. But Hashem shortened the life of Avraham Avinu by five years. Why? He did not want him to see his grandson Esav become a gangster. Going off the derech, become a criminal. From here we learn a few things. Who can tell me what you learn, learn from here? Let's see who's clever here. What do you learn from this? There is a very righteous man, one of the greatest in history of the world, that Hashem declared in the Torah how much he loves him. But Hashem took five years of his life. Why? Because he shouldn't see his grandson become Chiloni. He doesn't want his grandson to, to see his grandson become secular. What do we learn from here? Who can tell me what you learn from here? Compassion. Huh? Compassion. It's not worth to live if you have such a, such a, such a grandson. We learn from here a lot of things. One, you see that Hashem says it's better to die than to see your son become secular. Second, here we're not talking about son. We're talking about a grandson. Who do you love more, your son or your grandson? Son is closer to you. Even though the Gemara said, Bne banim ke banim, grandchildren are like children. Status of the grandchildren. Meaning if the father died, the grandson inherits the grandfather. Why? From the power of his father. But I'm not talking about inheritance now. I'm talking about feelings. Some people will swear that they enjoy their grandchildren more than they enjoy their own children. But that's not because they love them more, because now they have a peace of mind. Usually they're already in their 50s or 60s or 70s. They already have money, they are less stressed, they don't they work like slaves from morning to night. So they get to enjoy the grandchildren. Most of them are in pension already. They're not killing themselves. They have time to play with the kids. When they were in their 20s, working from morning to night between the learning, they didn't have time to enjoy. This is technical issues. But children are closer than grandchildren. So the point is, if Avram, Hashem didn't want Avram to see his grandson becoming secular, needless to say father. This is grandson, needless to say son, it's worse. When is it more painful? That your grandson gets off the path? Or when your son gets off the path? The answer, your son, because it's closer to you and it's more painful to you. Because you raised him. Your grandchild, you didn't raise him. When your son goes off the path, it's double killer. First, that now is not righteous anymore. Second, that you feel like a failure. I put all my life into this kid. So much time, effort, money, shivas, this. Personal example, in the end I fell. So it's double disappointment. So we learn from here that Hashem say for your own good Abraham, I'm taking you five years earlier from the world that you don't see what a monster your grandson is becoming. Okay, so it's needless to say when the son, the Gemara, by the way, say, a boy, your child that gets off the path, becomes secular, is worse than Milchemet Gog Magog. It's worse than the war, the final war that will destroy the entire world. We are, we are coming to those days that there will be the final war. 
It's called Milchemet Gog Magog. If you want to know about it, you can listen to my lectures about the topic. Or you can just read Zachary 14. Read the whole chapter of the Navi Zechariah. I'll tell you what's going to happen in the final war. So, just to make a long story short, two-thirds of the people will die in minutes, which is five billion people. And the other third will have a few years that Hashem will screen them. And in the end, will decide who would live and who doesn't. That means that approximately seven or more billion people will die from the beginning of Gog and Magog until the end of it. Then there will be resurrection of the dead and the rest of the prophecies. So seven billion at least people will die as not as bad as when you lose your own child and it become a Chalel Shabbat. That's what the Gemara says. And it's not an exaggeration. They ask the question that we have to ask, for whom? For whom it's worse than Gogu Magog? For the world? Or only for the father and mother of this boy? For whom it's a bigger tragedy? The answer only for the parents, not for the world. <laughs> Somebody comes to you and asks you, what would you like? One Jew go off the derech or the whole world will be destroyed? What do you have to choose? The world will not be destroyed with all the pain of that individual. But if you ask the father and the mother, for them, it's not as bad if the world will be finished, then, then, then they lose a child. They lose him and he's now disconnected from Hashem. For them, it's the end of the world. So, Abotai, one more thing we learn from Abraham. That once a person dies, he doesn't know every detail of the life of his children or grandchildren anymore. Because if Abraham would know from heaven the same exact thing about Esav, what's the point of taking him away? Let him live here. If he will get the same upset when he's in heaven, and he will be able to be aware of all the, the crimes that Esav commit, then what's the point of taking him earlier from the world? Leave him here, at least he will get some achievements here. So from here we see that the dead people don't see everything. If Hashem wants them to know certain things, He will inform them. But if not, they don't know. Sometimes they come in a dream and they send a message, like uh, this girl going to become pregnant or you're soon going to have a grandchild. It happens a lot, it's a common thing. The dead people come and inform about, usually it's about good news. Sometimes they come to say that they're hungry or they are naked. That's a very bad sign. Then you gotta right away do everything you can to help their soul. Kaddish, sponsor a lecture, lectures go to thousands of people. The Torah that people learn immediately help their soul. If, an, if a dead person come and say to you in a dream that he's naked and he's cold, then you know he's suffering very much. He's not in a good place. Why? He's naked from schuyot, from merits. Doesn't have merits. So he's naked from merits, from schuyot. Right the way you have to create for him schuyot. He had a gift from Hashem that he gave him permission to come to someone in a dream. Not everyone has that merit. It's very interesting. So, let's see, Rabotai, one other thing that we, we learn from this conversation between Paro and Yaakov. Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu LeYaakov, Ani milateticha me'esav, I saved you from Esav. Umi Lavan, I saved you from Lavan. Ve'echzarti lecha et Dina ve'et Yosef, I gave you back Dina from capture. She was a hostage. You got her back. And I gave you back Yosef as the king of Egypt. And you complain about your life, that your life were not great and they're bad? I swear. The 33 words that were used in your complaint for every word you're going to lose one year of your life. You were supposed to live like your father Yitzchak 180 years, 
because you complained to Paro and the complaint took 33 words, you're going to lose 33 years of your life. You understand the tragedy? One complaint took 20 seconds, 20 seconds. Complain about his life, which was 100% correct, what he said. His life was horrible. Nobody in history had such a difficult life. But Hashem was so upset from him, he shortened his life, midah keneged midah. You don't like your life? You complain about your life? Okay, you don't need life. Shh. Took away 33 years. He died 147. There's only one problem with this midrash. Why? The 33 words include the question that Paro asked him. Paro asked him, how old are you? How long is your life? So, how many words, you know, how many words actually Paro said? Not everything was Yaakov. Some of the words was the question of Paro. The answer is, Rabotai, why did Yaakov have to lose also the number of words that Paro said? Paro asked him a question. From the minute Paro finished his question, Yaakov started his complaint, but it was less than 33. We have to count how many words, I think six, seven. Why did he get extra years? Why? Okay, I complain, you punish me for every word that came out of my mouth. But why do I have to pay for the question that this wicked king asked me? How old are you? Right? Good question, no? Listen, you're not gonna believe it. You're going to learn something shocking here. In a book, Shomer Amunim, very, very strong book, Shomer Amunim, is only for brave people. It speaks a lot of, about a lot of Tikkun Abrit, modesty, watching the eyes, watching your holiness. Rabbi Aaron Rata, he lived in the past generation. In the part one, chapter, Confidence in Hashem. This is what he writes. We have in Judaism two very famous expressions. One, call man the avid rachmana latavavid. Everything Hashem does, does for the good, for the best. So, and then we have another expression, Gam zule tova. That's also for good. Kol man David Rachmana Latav Avid came from Rabbi Akiva. Gam zule tova came from Nachum Ish Gamzu. Another very holy rabbi in the same time, more or less. The question now, which one of the expressions is higher level? Everything Hashem does, does for good, or this is also for good? Which one is more recommended to use? Nachum huh? Ganzu, it's very high level. Why? Because you, when you say this is also for good, meaning I don't expect anything good to come out of it. This itself is already good. Rabbi Akiva say, right now what you see, it looks very bad because you don't see the end of the process. But this, for sure, will, you will see one day that it was for your own good. Right now you suffer, you complain, you're upset, you're bitter, you're disappointed. Wait X amount of time and you will see that it's for good. Like with Yosef, they're throwing him to the pit now and that's a beginning of a process that they will be in charge of all the money in the world and save the entire Jewish nation from starvation. So falling into the pit was the beginning of the greatest thing that could have happened. But right now, who, who would ever imagine such thing? When Yosef fell into the pit, what was the right expression to use? Everything Hashem does, does for good? 
or this is also good? That's the question. When you say, call man David Rachmana Latavavid, it's similar to the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 60. The Gemara speaks about, the Gemara speaks about Rabbi Akiva that came to a different city. And he couldn't find a place to sleep. He could not find a place to sleep. And he had to sleep in the field. Did you ever sleep in a field? Maybe in camping, no? When you go to camp, they make tents. Okay, but Rabbi Akiva had to sleep in a field, middle of the night. What happened? A lion came. A lion. And ate his donkey. Rabbi Akiva was on a donkey. The lion saw a donkey, attacked him, whatever it was, leper, donkey, uh, lion, ate the donkey. But Rabbi Akiva also had a rooster. Why would you take with you a rooster? Why do you need to take with you a rooster? Okay. Huh? Yes. He has to tell you where in the, when it's sunrise, the dawn, in the morning. So that's your alarm. The rooster is the alarm. They didn't have minyan in Chabad at 10.30, in the time of Rabbi Akiva. Everyone prayed in the nets. The fear Rambam, if you say Kriyat Shema after the nets, it's Bediyevet. Still, you still have three hours from sunrise, yes, but it's all Bediyevet. You should have done it right by the nets, Kriyat Shema. This is what Chacham Ben Tzion Abba Shaul used to do. Say Kriyat Shema in the nets, and then Daven at the seven o'clock minyan. But he makes sure to be up before the nets to say Kriyat Shema. So, it's very interesting. So now he has a rooster. You can say also maybe use the rooster also to give him some eggs. You can cook the eggs, you can survive, no? So, anyway, a cat came and ate the rooster. So now you're out of your car. Your car is total, the donkey. And your alarm doesn't work. Came the wind and put off the fire. You had fire that shows you the way, right? Like a torch or something. That's it. No more, no more fire. And Rabbi Akiva continued with his, with his expression. Call man, everything Hashem does, does for the best. I lost my transportation, fine, for good. I lost my rooster, fine, it's good. I lost my, uh, my fire, my light. What happened in the end? Groups of non-Jewish soldiers came to attack the city, murdered everyone, and the only survivor was Rabbi Akiva. The Hamas came, October 7, they killed everyone, but they didn't see Rabbi Akiva. Why didn't see him? Because there was no light. If they would see in the field light, they would know the coder. So putting off the light saved his life. Killing the rooster saved his life. The rooster would make noise, you hear, you hear people screaming, shooting, the rooster's gonna start panic. Killing the rooster was to save Rabbi Akiva's life. Killing the donkey was to save Rabbi Akiva's life. Donkeys make noise. So Hashem did three things that looks like a horrible thing. You just lose your transportation, you're on your own. You lose your light and you lose your alarm. And right after an hour or two, you realize that without that, you will be dead. Oh. So you see that Rabbi Akiva with his way, for sure Hashem is doing something that is good for me. I don't see it yet, but I will see. Now, what does it mean Gamzu Letova? This is also for good. It's a higher level than what Rabbi Akiva said. Rabbi Akiva says something good will come out of it. This right now is not good. Right now, it's, 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 it's a horrible thing for me now, to lose my light, to lose my donkey, to lose... But it will be something good coming out of it. The end of the process must be good. That's what Rabbi Akiva said. Nachum Ishgamzo said, this is good. Not good will come out of it. Right now it's good, meaning it's higher level. I'll give you an example. You know, 
There was a big rabbi, it's called, his name was the Magid Mimizrich. One person came to him, Hasid, asked him, Rabbi, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 54, the Gemara says, Chayav Adam Levarech Al Ara'a Keshem Shemevarech Al Atova. Person must bless Hashem for the bad exactly the same way he blessed Hashem for the good. The Gemara says you have to accept the bad in the same happiness like you accept the good. So he asked him, is it possible, Rabbi, come on, be realistic. You know these people, Rabbi, come on, let's be realistic. Is something like this possible? It's not possible. The rabbi say, go to the yeshiva, look for Rabbi Zusha. He's a very big tzaddik, Rabbi Zusha, very poor, a very big tzaddik. Ask him your question. He went to the yeshiva, he's looking for Rabbi Zusha, which was completely poor, Ani Marud. He could not even buy bread. That's how poor he was. And... He not always had a place to sleep. His physical life was mamash difficult. So he came to him and said, my rabbi sent me to you. My rabbi sent me to you to ask you this question. So he said to him, I'm very surprised at your rabbi. I'm very surprised. He should, have asked, he should have asked you to go to someone that have hard life. Why did he send you to me? And by me, I don't remember one time having something bad in my life. He lives like a homeless. And he has days that he doesn't have bread to eat even. Hungry two, three days in a row. I don't know what bad is. I never saw that I had bad, bad, anything bad happening to me. That's when the, the Hasid realized why the Magid Mimizri sent him to Rabbi Zusha. Say, if a person has confidence in Hashem and Emunah, there's no difference between good and bad by him. Everything is good. Why Yaakov was punished from the words of Paro? Because Rashi writes, why Paro asked Yaakov that question? Because he looked very old and depressed. Because someone that has suffering, mentally suffers, it makes him get old faster. Because of that, Paro asked him that question. So it was his fault that he did not have enough confidence in Hashem. If he would be in a higher level, in a confidence, Nothing would bother him. Not Yosef, not Dina, not Esav, nothing. Nothing would bother him. Perfectly happy, like Rabbi Zuzha. I don't know what you're talking about. I never had anything bad in my life. Once you reach such a high level, nothing ever affects you mentally. Never. Or take away your happiness. If you're a very happy person, you look young, you look fresh, you don't have white hair, you don't lose your hair. A lot of these things come from stress, less wrinkles. Sometimes people, because of stress, lose a lot of weight. They look like, like scarecrow, like this tripod. Sometimes it's the other way around. All day depressing chocolate. Why are you eating chocolate all day? I'm depressed, Rabbi. Don't you see your face? It's all pimples, greasy, this, that. Tons you eat all the time sugar. Your sugar is 500 already. It's a miracle you're walking. Ma, what can I do? I have hard life. I'm not talking about drugs and other problems. Why you smoke all day? Life is tough, Rabbi. You don't know. I don't want to tell you all my problems. All of this comes from Sickness in our confidence in Hashem. We have a sickness. The nefesh is chola. But what do you want? If there is a complaint against Yaakov Avinu, the biggest tzaddik on earth, that we are named after him, Israel, his name was changed to Israel. 
If against Yaakov, Hashem had a complaint, if you would have more confidence in me, you would not look so old, you would not become old fast, Paro would not dare to ask you, how old are you? Because the question came from you, it's your fault, I'm also including his words in your punishment. Now I want to ask you, is this a reasonable punishment? What do you think? Based on your humble opinion, for every word, one year of life. Or oh, it looks like a little bit too harsh. At his level. If Hashem would consult with you, would take you to the bed din, make a, a bed din to sit. We'll ask you, Eliyahu, what do you think I should punish Yaakov for? My opinion, one year for every word. What would you say? No, so what would you do? You would, you would say to Hashem, Hashem, in his level, you're right. He deserves one year for every word. Or you try to ease the punishment. Hashem, listen, it's very hard, you know. Well, look what happened to his daughter. Look what happened to his son. It's, we are people. We are not angels. We're we'll trying to get him out of it, no? Anyone here, be honest with me. Everyone here would imagine to give him one year for every word? Huh? It's a little bit too, too difficult. We're not too difficult. This is what we say in the Tfilah. Samchenu ki imot einitanu. Shnot rainu, shnot rainu ra. We ask Hashem when the salvation will come, please make us happy in the same ratio that you punished us. What's the ratio? I'll give you two proofs. The spies, they went to Israel, back and forth, across to all directions to spy the land. 40 days from the minute they left until they came back. 40 days, and in the end they spoke Lashon Ara about the Holy Land. For every day, the nation of Israel that started to cry and didn't have confidence in Hashem, again, lack of confidence, lack of faith, for every day we got one year torture in the desert. One year we had to walk in circles in the desert for every day that the spies tore Israel. So what's the ratio? A year for a day. A year for a day. With Yaakov, even worse, a year for word, not for a day, for word. Imagine if Yaakov would give a whole story of 5,000 words. What would be then? See, this is what we say to Hashem. Samchenu, make us happy, ki imot einitanu, like the days you tortured us. Shnot, rainu ra'a. All these years that we saw problems and tragedies non-stop, like now, look how much we suffer. Give us the same ratio. For every day we suffer from the Arabs, give us one year of pleasure. For every day we suffer from the Nazis, give us one year of pleasure. If you take 3,300 years since we got the Torah until today, there was not one day without tortures. Do the math. How much is 3,300 multiplied by 365? How many days you have? Probably millions, no? Take now each day, and how much you're supposed to get for it? One year of pleasure. That's a very good deal. Do you understand or no? That's very similar to the story I once told you that the Jew walked in a forest and the guy saw him and started to beat him up. The king passed by with his soldiers, stopped the guy, what are you doing? So, ah, what do you care? As a Jew, I'm beating him up. Oh yeah, arrest him. They took him to the king's palace, they took the Jew there, he said to the doctor, take care of him, he has broken bones. In the meantime, the guy is waiting for a trial, he's in jail. 
Once the Jew recovered, the king made it right. He asked the Goy, how many times you hit him? He was afraid to lie to the king. He said, about a hundred times. He asked the Jew, is that right? He said, yes, about a hundred times. He said to the Goy, you have to pay him a thousand rubles for every time you hit him. And you must pay him by tomorrow. If not, I'll hang you here. The Goy said, absolutely, no problem. He ran, brought a suitcase full of cash, paid it to the Jew. The Jew, once the Jew heard the verdict of the king, he started to cry. Ah, he's <laughs> the king said, what happened? You don't look happy. Why are you crying? I wasn't a, a fair judge. He said, no, your majesty, you're great. I'm not crying because of you. I'm crying because of myself, how dumb I was. So what do you mean? He said, when he was beating me up, I was holding the stick, pushing him. Defending myself, resisting. As a result of me fighting back, I only got a hundred times, you know, a hundred hits by, by the stick. If at the time he was beating me up, I knew that every shot is a thousand rubles, I walk months for that. I would help him faster. Why, why are you so lazy? Move your hand faster. This is a, a little bit of a funny story, but it, it's much accurate. Every suffering you have will turn into paradise one day. This is what we say, Samchenu, ki imnot einitanu, shnot rainu ra'a. For every day you torture us, for every day we did something wrong, you gave us a year. For every day now you want to give us good, also give us a year. Has to be a fair deal. Soon it's going to happen, after all the suffering. Now, Rabotai, let's dig a little bit deeper into this Gemara. Because I'm sure you heard it many times, but we never actually dived into this sugiah. Let's see what does it really mean. A person has to say bracha for the bad, the same, with the same happiness that he say bracha for the good. This is, remember the page, this is Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 54. You say for the bad, just like you say for the good. On a good thing, just like you say for the bad thing. Shouldn't be a difference between good and bad by you. Everything is good. חייב אדם לברך על הרעה כשם שמברך על הטובה, שנאמר, as it's written, in Deuteronomy 6, there is a verse, ואהבת את השם אלוקיך בכל לבבך ובכל נפשך ובכל מאודיך. זה גמרא עשה, בכל נפשך, with all your heart, with all your money and with all your soul. בכל נפשך, it means, אפילו נוטל את נפשך. Even when Hashem now, it's your last second of your life, they're about to execute you, you have to love Hashem just as much when you win the lottery. Same thing. דבר אחר, another explanation. בכל מאודיך, what does it mean ברורון בכל מאודיך? בכל ממונך, with all your money. Even Hashem wipe you out in a second from 50 years of saving, you have to dance and thank Him, thank you for everything, I love you. Davar Acher, another explanation, Bechol Meodecha, Bechol Mida U Mida Shu Moded Lecha. It's not only with all your money, with everything you have or you don't have, you praise Hashem. You have, thank you, Hashem. You don't have, thank you for, for not giving me. Have a modelo. Always be grateful. What happens if a person feels that there is a serious judgment against him by Hashem? He has to thank Hashem. Odecha Hashem, ki anaftabi. I'm thanking you, Hashem, for smacking me. I know it's for my own good. Top. The Gemara continue. חייב אדם לברך, what does it mean a person has to bless, what kind of bracha he has to say? מה היא חייב לברך על הרעה כשם שמברך על הטובה? 
אילמה, if you're going to say, כשם שמברך על הטובה, טוב ואמיתיב, we have ברכה, ברוך אתה השם, אלוקינו מלך העולם, הטוב והמיטיב, the good and, uh, and, and the one that benefits, that give good, טוב. כך מברך על הרעה, הטוב והמיטיב. So when a tragedy happens, we also have to say הטוב והמיטיב. But it doesn't add up. והגמרא קונטיניו. ואתנן, איזה קושייה. על בשורות טובות אומר הטוב והמיטיב. We learn in a משנה, when you hear something good, you say הטוב והמיטיב. Someone just gave you good news. You say הטוב והמיטיב. ועל בשורות רעות, when you hear about a tragedy, what do you say? ברוך דיין האמת. אמר רבא, לא נצרכה אלא לקבולינו הוא בשמחה. Why do you have two different ברכות? You have to accept the tragedy with שמחה. אמר רב אחא משום רבי לוי, הגמרא continue to analyze it. מה יקרה? What is the meaning of the verse in תהילים, in Psalms 101? What does it say over there? חסד ומשפט אשירה לך השם. Once you give me kindness, mercy, chesed, and mishpat, judgment, I will sing to you no matter what. Kindness, chesed, mercy, judgment. Ashira le Hashem. Ashira le Hashem azamera. I will sing for you. What's the difference between lashir and lezamer? Ma, when a person say, Ashir, and when a person say Azamer, what's the difference? Shir means you sing without instruments, without violin, drums. Zemer means with drums and violin, guitar, whatever instruments you have. Im chesed, Ashira. Im mishpat, Ashira. If you kind to me and have mercy on me, I will sing for you, meaning praise you. If you judge me, I will sing for you. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani Amar, where do we learn it from? From Tehilim 56, Psalms 56. Ba'ashem ha'alel davar, ba'elohim ha'alel davar. When Hashem comes in mercy, how is it written? Yud, hey, vav, and hey. That's the merciful name. When Hashem comes as judgment, how, does it read, how is it written in the Torah? Elokim, with A. That's the judgment name. So David say, when you appear to me as the letter Yud, Hei, Vav, and A, meaning in mercy, I will sing. When you come to me as Elokim, the God of judgment, I will also sing and praise you. Rabbi Tanchum Omer, where we learn it from? Tehilim 116, I'm giving you all the sources, you can later read it. What's written in Tehilim Psalms 116? Kos Yeshua Tesa, What do we say? Kos right? We say it in Avdala, Berkat Amazon. What does it mean, Kos Yeshua Tesa? I will lift. Lift up a glass of salvation and call in the name of God. We have another verse. Tzara ve'yagon emtza, trouble and agony I will find, uveshem Hashem ekra. Let me ask you a question. When a person has a tragedy, something terrible comes to him, sad, breaking the heart. Is this considered like finding a lost object? Emtza, it's called metzia. Metzia means when you find something, it makes you happy. You just find a diamond ring. David say, I just found a gift. What is my gift? Tragedy and agony. For that, I'm going to praise Hashem. Uveshem Hashem ekra, I'm going to call God. Tzara ve'yagon emtza, uveshem Hashem ekra. Rabbanan says, where we learn from? Job 1. Hashem Natan, Hashem Lakach, Yishem Hashem Evorach. God gave, 
God took, the name of God should be blessed whether he gives you, whether he takes it away from you. So we have a lot of sources. Look how many sources. Tov. The Meiri, one of the greatest Rishonim, almost 900 years ago, the Meiri writes, sometimes a person will be punished for his sins. Beraot rabot, Hashem smack him non-stop. Boom, 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 one after the other. But he has to remember who smacks him. The one who loves him the most in the world. When someone loves you, smack you, it's not as painful when your enemy smack you. Because when your enemy smack you, he wants bad for you. When, you're, when the one who loves you the most smack you, he wants good for you. That's a great comfort. I'll give you an example. You walk in the street. Someone comes from behind. You don't know who. And hit you very bad on your back. Boom! Ah, broke your spine. You are fuming. Your fist is ready, you're about to turn and break his teeth. You turn around, your best friend that saves your life. No one you love more than him. Ah, Moshe, wow! Forgot about the fist, hugs, kisses, tears of joy. <laughs> what happened? Once you found out who smacked you, you didn't even care about the smack anymore. <laughs> it was a blessing. When you get smacked now on the road, or oh, when something happened, you know 100% is Hashem smacking you. How can you be upset? Your, be your, your closest friend, Hashem, your father. Rabotai, listen carefully. The Rambam, in his commentary to the Mishnayot, to the Mishnah, this is what he writes. Vezay davar muskal etzel anevonim. This is something obvious by the smart people. Afal pi shelo izira alaf Torah, even though the Torah didn't warn you specifically about it. But it's common sense. Lefi shar bedvarim nechshavim lera bitchilata, many things looks bad in the beginning. But in the end, they are great blessing. Many things in the beginning looks great and sweet, but end very bad and very bitter. Therefore, a smart person should never be upset when something bad happens right now because he doesn't know where it goes and should not be happy when something good starting now because he doesn't know how it's end. Therefore, there should not be any difference between good and bad by you. It's all the will of Hashem. And that's, what I'm, that's all I care about. That's it. It's a very high level. Vegzera arat sakana lefish no yodea tachlit. He doesn't, you don't know how it's gonna end. אבל האזהרה מהדאבון והצער, הרי הוא מפורסם מאוד בספרי הנביאים עד שאין צורך לדבר עליו. But the warning not to be sad, not to be upset, it's already published in all the prophets. And there is no need to add more to their words. So רבותיי, it's very interesting. The conclusion here is very obvious. You cry for something you shouldn't. You dance for something you shouldn't, because you don't know how it's going to end. But I want to ask you a question. Who can give me an example that someone just came and told you something? One piece of news. And you have to say two blessings. One, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam HaTov HaMetiv. And right after that, Baruch Ata Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Dayan HaEmet. It looks like a contradiction. When the good, you have to say HaTov HaMetiv. When something bad, you have to say Baruch Dayan HaEmet. How can you say both? If someone just came and told you your father died, 
There's good news or bad news? Bad news. You don't want your father to die. It breaks the heart. For that, you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokeinu Melech HaOlam, Dayan HaEmet. But you just remember your father left you 50 million dollars. You're the only son. So until now, your father was very stingy and very tough with you, barely gave you for rent. You're still working night shift as a waiter. But now, you just became a very, very rich man. For that, you say, Baruch Atah Hashem, Elokein Melech HaOlam, Atov Ve'Ametim. That's, by the way, in case you didn't realize, an indication that our lives have a lot of moments of contradictions, which gives us mixed feelings. Mixed feelings. I'll give you an example. Your wife became pregnant after 10 years. You suffered so much 10 years. Finally, the doctor told you, Mazal Tov, you have twins. But a minute before delivery, they told you, we're sorry, there was a risk to your life. We had to choose one of the two. We deliver one and the other one died. Now, are you happy or are you sad? There's two ways to look at it. Very happy, because finally you have a child after 10 years. You're very broken hard that you were about to have two. That's it, it's your last chance. And now you're going to be left with one. The two could be a boy and a girl. That's mitzvah pruvu. You need to have a boy and a girl. Ten boys or ten girls is not pruvu. You need at least one boy and one girl. But many people don't know it's not enough just to have a boy and a girl at least. You need to wait until they get married and to make sure they can have kids. So for instance, if you have a lot of boys and one girl only, Right now, it looks like you fulfill the first commandment of the Torah, Pro Milu Taaretz. Get married and have children. But if, God forbid, one day you find out that this girl cannot have kids, or if you have five girls and one boy, it looks like you fulfill your Pro But then one day you find out this boy got married and he cannot, cannot conceive his wife. That's it. It's not, cannot be pregnant for me. So in that case, you find retroactive that what you thought that you actually fulfilled the mitzvah of Purvu, it was just an illusion. It was really not reality. What happened if you had five girls and five, five boys? For sure, at least one and one will have kids, no? Cannot be all ten don't have kids. So from the five boys, at least one will have two grandchildren, right? Bring your grandchildren. And from the five, at least one will give you grandchildren. So right there, you for sure have provu. Right or wrong? Wrong. Why wrong? God forbid if they're all on a, fl on a, on a flight to a wedding, family wedding. They're all on a flight and the flight crashed. And all of them died. God forbid. We just lost your mitzvah. And up to now, you had a mitzvah. Once they died, retroactive, you don't have the mitzvah. So this mitzvah of Pro it's depend on reality. You may ask, wait a minute, well, I have no say. Yes. I, did, I can do my, as much as I want. In the end, it's not in my hand. You are the one who decides if I will have children, if they can have kids, or if they live or die. It's all in your hand. 1% is in my hand, 99% is in your hand. Right or wrong? Yes. Wrong. It's all in your hand. It's all in your hand. Why people have problems uh, having kids? Whose fault is this? Hashem decide this couple won't have kids. My, it's a Russian roulette? In Shamayim? Israeli roulette? Ma, Persian roulette? What does Hashem have? Hop, number came on this couple. Ten years barren. It's ma, random? Of course not. It's depend on your lifestyle. In this world or in the past life? Sometimes it's for past life. It's past life and you cannot understand Still your fault. Still your fault. Let's say you are a man 
like they say in America, don't, don't Juan. Don't want to get married. It's sick, you're 40 already. Get married, have children. No, oh, life is great. I don't want to lock my hands, handcuffs. Let's enjoy. All his life like this died. No children, no nothing. Comes back to the world. He doesn't know that in his past life many girls wanted to marry him, but he, he didn't care. Now he has to, his distance to live and not to have kids. Mida keneged mida. When I wanted to give you kids, you rejected me. You wanted to follow your desires. Huh? One girl, this girl, one week, this girl, the next month, that girl. You don't want to get married. You don't want obligation. One girl said, I, uh, I have a date with a guy. He asked me if I can still have kids. I said yes. Okay, so he agreed to, to date. But I'm not interested to have kids. An older woman. Technically, physically, she can still have kids. By the law of nature, of course, if Hashem would agree. But she doesn't want kids. So now she asks if she, she must tell the guy before the date in advance that she doesn't plan to have kids. Or she will tell him after two or three dates, after he fall in love with her, and would like her too much, that he will take her, you know, as a package deal. I take you with, the, with, this, with this problem, that you don't want kids. No, what, what do you think the answer is? She must tell him up front. Why? Why? No, it's not Mekah Ta'ut. Mekah Ta'ut is only if she didn't tell him before they got married. Meaning, if she told him before the marriage, I just want you to know I cannot have kids, or I do not want to have kids. If you want to marry me like this, he say, okay, that's no Mekah Ta'ut. She told him before. Sometimes people lie on their age. They go on a date. How old are you? I pass 40. Can you be more specific? I have another call. So she assumed 42, 43. In the end, it's 49 and 11 and a half months. It's a big difference, 41, 42, or 49 and a half. If he tells her before the engagement, I just want to, I want you to sit down, hold tight. He hands her his driver's license. She see the age, she make a big drama, of course. You lie to me, this, that. But in the end, she told him before. And he agreed to marry her. That's not make a That was a lie, that was deceiving, that was uh, cheating, whatever you want to say. But in the end, make a is only in the time of the marriage if you hid critical information from your future spouse. What does it mean, critical information? Not that you have a pimple in your back. That's not critical information. Pimples come and go. Or that you have uh, some um, allergy to some food. Big deal, so you don't need that food. What is, how is it going to affect your future husband that you don't like milk or something like that? That's not a, that's not a reason to cancel a marriage. But if it's something hereditary, that will pass to the children, or there's something in the family that happened already to a few of the brothers, or all kinds of things like that, you must say it. For instance, a woman, she was with a guy once in her life. She's forbidden to a Kohen. She cannot hide it from him. There's not going to be blessing in this marriage. Kohen is a servant of Hashem. He cannot marry so a woman that was once even with a goy, not allowed. So therefore, if she hides it, that's mekach ta'ut. If he finds out later on, someone come and testify, he can throw her out from the marriage without paying her any ktuba. She lost her ktuba. She lost all her rights. This is called mekach ta'ut. You were forbidden to me, and you lied. Do you understand what it means, mekach ta'ut? Something critical. Of course, I don't want anyone to make their own judgments and rules. You need 
to always ask a chacham. Rabbi, I'm going on a date, they're asking me all kinds of questions. What am I obligated to say? What I'm not obligated to say. You have to say these things. Some things you are obligated to say, some things you are not obligated. For instance, if the girl was not so righteous, let's say now she's 22, between age 15 and 18, she was not the way Hashem expected her, a, a Jewish girl to be. And uh, now she, Baruch Hashem, became very religious, she's mamash, very modest, a great bargain. But it's for him, it's not enough that she's a Sarai Menu right now. He wants to know her past. So when he asked her on a date, were you ever with a man before me? She cannot lie and say no. Because they will find out after the wedding that she was already with someone else. That can cancel the wedding. Without, you don't need get for that. It's make achtaut. But if, if he wants to know specific details, how many boyfriends you had in your life, or stuff like that, what age you started to date guys, uh, did you, all kinds of things. Were you ever with a non-Jew? But it's not a coin. So she doesn't have to give him details to all the horrible things she did in her life. Why? Because she's right now Baalat Shuvah. It's like a new baby that was born. She's righteous right now. It's enough he knows that she with someone at least once in her life. He already knows. And therefore, if he wants to know details, she, she should answer, let's say, that I was not Sarai Menu until age 18. Let him understand whatever he understands. Why? He wants to know details. You insist, I'm not giving you details. Break the Shidduch. She doesn't have to specifically start naming all her horrible and shaming sins. Why? Because the rule is when someone does Tshuva, you're not allowed to remind him his old days. And I'll have to come to some, remember what a gangster used to be in the old days? Wow, remember you with your Cadillac convertible, with the gun, with your Goya girlfriend in Manhattan. You're not allowed to talk about this. This is a very common mistake. You know when it's become the worst? That let's say you become a tzaddik, you already have a wife, children, I don't know, 20, 30 years, you already shomer mitzvot. And you invite guests for Shabbat, and there's always going to be that fool who begin to ask personal questions in front of your children. So what age you became tzaddik? I heard you used to be a gangster. All the kids, chassidim, peot. They all get the shock of their life. You know these annoying people that you, the father changed the subject? Oh, wow, what a great osvom. <laughs> <laughs> Great Shulem, enjoy! No, no, hey Rabbi, tell me, what age you became Shomer Shabbat? Can ruin the life of a person. How do you know if these kids don't know? It's similar to a kid that comes to a, person, to a house and see a baby, plays with a baby, and then give him Coca-Cola. Destroy the life of the, of the mother. Now he doesn't want a nurse. What happened to him? Of course, he tasted the forbidden fruit. That's it. Or put chocolate in his mouth. Babies, kids are addicted to sugar. Smart parents don't let kids to have access to candy at all. Sugar and stuff like that. Get them used to fruit, stuff like that. Try from a very young age to get them used to eat healthy. No wonder two-thirds of the kids in America look like balloons. Why? From a very young age, you make them sugar addict. All day, they want cakes and ice cream and Coca-Cola, all the drinks with sugar. It's terrible. In Israel, there are warnings on the bottle. Contains a lot of sugar. There's a lot of warnings on the drinks. It's crazy. Ten spoons of sugar in one glass of juice whatever they sell over there. Plus all the colors and all these things that they put in it, some of that is clear poison. Not that the diet is any better. 
There's also things that have cancer in it. But it's all a matter of how you get people used to eat. You get them used to eat healthy from a very young age, later you have less suffering. Also make sure that your kids are not addicted to all kinds of uh, kosher movies. Kosher. What does it mean kosher movies? Biographies of all kinds of important people. Why it's dangerous? What's wrong if you see the life of the Rambam in a cartoon movie? Or the life of Rashi? Or the Jewish holidays? It's educational films. Kosher. Orthodox kosher. Nothing is wrong with the film except one thing. It gets the kid addicted to the screen. It's very addictive. Now, his brain found an easy way to understand things. It's very hard for him to learn Gemara from now, to break his head, to understand what's written. He's not interested. He would like this to be presented to him on a screen, easy. Kids that were exposed to screens, even kosher films and kosher uh, clips, they are not doing good in schools from that moment on for the rest of their life. That's it. They only relate to visual things. They're not interested to read books. They're not interested to learn Gemara. Very dangerous. You, in one hand, you achieve that they get some education from these films, and then you make them unable to learn Gemara. Then their life in the world of yeshivot is basically destroyed. It will affect their shiduch. Nobody would want them. No serious girl will want him. It's going to be a disaster. Most of the time, women do it because they want a peace of mind and quiet. Sometimes for good reason. She wants to read Tehillim every day. So it takes her three hours to finish the book. While she's doing it, she makes the kids watch something that she got kosher, kosher, 100% kosher. Uncle Moishi, thinking about the Jewish holidays. Well, the kids enjoy the music. They see kids in the kindergarten. The content of the film is not the problem. The problem is the cre you're creating an addiction now to the, to the screens. Once they get addicted to it, that's all they want. You can see it even when they come from yeshiva, right away they run to their parents' phone to see something. Not even a kosher clip. The Satan has many ways to trap people. Screens is one of the major things. Screens, electronic LED screens today all over the world destroyed more Jews than anyone. You know how many families are broken from screens, from Facebook, from Instagram, from YouTube, from who knows what. Destroys thousands of families. Tens of thousands of kids became drug addicts, became Chalilei Shabbat, married non-Jews, destroyed their souls from screens. You know how many families are broken because of that? The rabbis today cannot do any more shalom bayit. That's, it's, it's, uh, you lost the war. The war is lost before it even started. You know? So, Rabotai. Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, the Mashgiach, the Holy Rav, he was the one who asked this question. Why Yaakov had to be punished for the words of Paro? And the conclusion is, when a person is worried and upset and has agony and sadness, and he becomes affected by that physically, it's his fault. And because of that, Hashem will punish him. I punish you for not having confidence in me. Rabbi, I'm not such a tzaddik. I don't have so much emunah. You'll be punished for that. You don't have a get out of jail free card here. Same thing with what I say. People don't have kids. It's their own actions. They watch things. They commit sins with girls and guys before they get married. 
They watch things they're not supposed to. They listen to things they're not supposed to. They have problems with their emunah. They have problems with their tefillah. And sometimes the problems is from past life. How do I know it? It's a clear verse in Parashat Bechukotai. It's written in Parashat Bechukotai. If you listen to me, I will bless your fertility. No one will be barren. And if you don't follow my way, I will make your women barren. It's a clear verse in the Torah. It's no nature. Nature, your eggs are like this. Who made the eggs like this? And why? You have PCOS. Who made her with that? And why? You have problem with your seeds. Why? Random? Nothing is random. Any surim below avon. Nigmarase. There's no suffering unless there was a prior sin that came before. And all punishments in life are measure for measure. Please don't ever forget these principles. I did not make them up. I only read them to you. Unfortunately, in today's generation, many of the speakers hide it from the public. It's not popular to speak about painful subjects, painful topics, does not bring rating. Does not make people crazy about the speaker enough. Definitely does not bring donations. So why should I talk about controversial topics? They're not controversial. Controversial means if it's questionable, if it's true or not. That's called controversial. Some say it's true, some say it's not true. Today when people say controversial speaker, that's because they are morons. They don't know alphabet of Torah. If they would read the Gemara, nothing would be controversial. It's all black and white. Controversial is when two people know the book 100% word by word and disagree about certain meanings. That's called an argument. What? Who's right? Rashi or Rambam? Rashi or Tosfot? Argument. Okay. But when someone reads to you simple principle of kindergarten or first grade, and you have all kinds of polit politicians who say, no, that's not the way, that's not Hashem's way. A bunch of crooks. Nothing but crooks. Every crook has a different reason why he's lying right now. Some wants popularity, some wants money, some wants empathy, compliments, attention, grading. But some, they mean well. Not everyone is a crook. Some means well. In their mind, they are convinced that being harsh to the people bringing all the truth to their face may get them too scared and they'll run away completely. It's a logical claim or no? What do you think? Logical claim or no? Yes. Very not logical. Usually you know the answer, Eliyahu. But this time you messed up. Why it's not logical? You'll tell me why it's not logical. You get upset. I got upset that I didn't win the lottery last <laughs> night. I'm very upset. People short people upset they're not tall. Too tall, upset they're not a little bit shorter. Heavy people wants to be skinny. Too skinny wants to gain weight. Everyone has a dream. Everyone is upset about something. Nobody dies from being upset. Let's start with that. The question is why that claim that he may get scared is completely not logical and completely not legal. One at a time, Benji. I cannot understand two people that speak together. Um, Baruch Hashem did not get to that level yet. Go ahead. But I'm asking you, why that claim 
that they are afraid that people will get scared and run away, it's not a valid claim. Give me a, we are in a trial now, we, we sit in front of a judge. I am a lawyer on one side and you are a lawyer on the other side. I'm asking you now to prove to the judge why it's not a valid claim. Okay, you have to say the truth to the public. You have to say the truth, you have to say the Well, but he say, who, who's to say you always have to say all the truth? When you have a child that is five years old, you talk to him about how kids come to the world? No. Wait when they grow a little bit, no? Why don't you tell him the whole truth? He asks you, Mommy, how did I come to the world? Okay, and too young to know it. One day you'll find out. But your audience is adult people. Audience Not always you have to tell a person all the truth. Even I, what, when I come to a person, he asks me, tell me, what, what, where is your CD about the hell that you once made? It's not online. Why wouldn't you put it online? Because it's not for everyone. Not everyone can handle all that truth. So now I gave you two hints, but you still didn't, didn't get the point yet. So I'll answer you. When Hashem gave the Torah, did he know the future of the world until the last day of earth? Yes. Okay. Did he know all the Jews that will come to the world and will live, include the people that live in our time? Yes. Did he still write in the Torah 12 times Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yomad Venichreta Nefesh Ha'i that you'll read it in first grade in every yeshiva in the world? You read it when you read the parasha. Mechalel Shabbat Mot Yomad Venichreta Nefesh Ha'i. Every kid reads it in, in yeshiva when they do the cycle of the Torah. Does it still written that homosexuality is death penalty by stoning and a permanent cut for the soul from the afterlife? It's written in the Torah. Does it say the punishment of all kinds of other sex crimes? It's written in the Torah. Does it say that certain people in the history of the Jewish world, Jewish nation were executed, included by Moshe Rabbeinu? Did Moshe kill Tzlofchad? Yes. He killed him. It's written in the Torah. Why? For breaking Shabbat. Moshe killed him. Who told Moshe to kill Tzlofchad? Hashem. Every kid reads it in yeshiva. Okay, very good. When the Jews made Avodah Zarah, idol worshipping, they dance around the golden calf. What did Moshe do? Executed 3,000 of them. Moshe, Moshe, the legend, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, Musa, executed 3,000 religious Jews for dancing around the grave of the Rebbe. In this case, it was a golden calf. What difference does it make? It's an idol worshipping either way. Worshipping a grave, worshipping a tzaddik, worshipping a golden calf, or Buddha. Same thing, it's Avodah Zarah. What did Moshe do to the idol worshippers? Execute them with no mercy. 3,000. We have now an ongoing tragedy. About 1,500 died so far with the soldiers, with, them, with about 1,500, I don't know the exact numbers. And everyone is broken for three months. I don't think there's not one Jew that doesn't have terrible feeling in his heart. For so many people who are dying, continue to die every day. Every morning, you wake up in the morning, two more, three more, five more. It's, it's, it's ongoing tragedy. And we so far reach half of the tragedy of the golden calf. Right away, in one day, Moshe killed 3,000. 3,000, and the nation were not so big like today. Today, you have 15 million Jews in the world. In the time of Moshe, you had 3 million. A fifth. So killing 3,000 in the time of Moshe, it's like 15,000 today, same ratio. If now 15,000 Jews will die in a day, how would we feel? 1,500 dies in three months and we crashed. All of these things are written in the Torah. Why didn't Hashem worry that it will make some Jews run away from his Torah? It's execution, threats, stoning, permanent cut. Why didn't Hashem erase it from the Torah? What? In Kabbalah, there are many things that are not written in the Torah. 
1% of the Jews will be exposed to it, those who want to learn Kabbalah. All these things that I made, the CD in Masechet Geinom, it all comes, almost all of it comes from Kabbalah. 10, 20% from the Gemara, 80% from the Zohar. I never published it. Why? It's not good for every Jew to know it. Some people will go to bed for the rest of their life, depressed for the rest of their life, when they read what's waiting for them in the next world for being Mechalelei Shabbat. Do I want to make people paralyzed mentally? No. For those who are strong and can handle the truth, we hand them back then in time the CDs. But this CD is already maybe 10 years discontinued. That's it. I met maybe 100, 150 of them, hand them to very few individuals, and that's it. It was not post online. Why? Because if Hashem wanted all this information to be published to every teenager, he would write it in the Chumash. The fact that Hashem did not write it in the Chumash, and most of that is not even in the Gemara, that means it's partially confidential. It's not good for every person. It's good for 5%, 10%, 20%, not more. Therefore, you have to be careful who you teach it to. But when you talk about reward and punishment and execution and gay parades and gay marriage and all these things, these are written in a book of God. It's a public information to the whole world. Everyone who decides otherwise is a criminal. He means well, but you know the say that they have. <laughs> the way to hell is full of good intentions. And everyone who tells you otherwise, either he doesn't understand the point, or he's just lying to you. But at least, at least, these kind of speakers, they mean well. Which is already something. The other ones, they want money, they want fame, they want rating, they want popularity. They don't mean well, they're selfish. This one at least thinking, I'm doing the right thing. Oh, at least, okay, so it's an innocent mistake. Let's give them the benefits of the doubt. But the answer is, what they do, it's not logical and it's not valid. Maybe they mean well, maybe they have good intentions, maybe they think their ways of Kirov is good. The answer is they are wrong, because we don't care about our common sense and our logic. We care about Hashem's logic. Now, I know that some of you are still not convinced. Some of you are still not convinced. So allow me to read to you the words of the greatest posek in Jewish history. Who is he? Who is the greatest posek in the last thousand years? Rambam. Rambam. Is Rambam good enough for you or no? No, 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 that's a different, it's not in Mishneh Torah. <laughs> Let's see. I read to you the words of the Rambam. It's in the introduction to More Nevochim. What is it, the guide or, to the complex? Huh? Perplex. It's a hard word. One day I'll learn it, hopefully in this life. This is the introduction. Remember, before the actual book started, there's an introduction. And this is what the Rambam writes. V'chol ma'asecha yihiyu l'shem shamayim. All your actions should always be for the sake of heaven. Meaning, don't think what's in it for me, how do I benefit, what will I gain, what will I lose. Forget about you. Program yourself to think what will Hashem benefit from here? What will Hashem think about this? What would Hashem want right now? It's not easy. To be, to be in this level, to be Hashem Shamayim? It's very difficult. All your actions should be for the sake of heaven. On these two introductions I leaned, 
במה שחיברתי בקצת פרקי זה. I counted on these two introductions in what I wrote here in this chapter. זה המאמר, סוף דבר, conclusion. אני האיש, I am the man. אשר, כשיציקו העניין, when you pressure me, meaning you push me to the corner, you force me to speak. ויצר לו הדרך, and the road became, the path became narrow, meaning I have nowhere to run. לא אמצא תחבולה ללמד האמת, I will not find any way to teach the truth, שבא עליו מופת, אלא בשיעות לאחד המעולה ולא יעות לעשרת אלפים שכלים. I do not find any way to teach the truth, even knowing that it will fit the one superb Jew. but will not be for 10,000 fools. לעשרת אלפים שכלים. You have a stadium with 10,100 Jews. One is seeking for the truth. He wants closeness to Hashem. He wants to know what's going to be his end if he won't repent. He wants to learn everything authentic, the way it's written. Don't teach me politics, don't sugarcoat anything. Tell it to me as it is. Rabbi, please, I'm begging you. I remember when I used to give the Hebrew lectures by Dina Moshe, we gave maybe 500 lectures in that apartment alone over the years. Many of the Hebrew series and some of the English one we did over there, Queens Boulevard, before she moved to Jerusalem in the time of Corona. There were a bunch of Bukharian guys 19, 18, 20, 21, 22. Every Monday I was there. I used to finish the first lecture in English and run quickly to there, start around 10.30 until 1, 12.30. The guys used to come, she used to serve food. More and more guys are coming for years, for years. You know, I mean, some of them are already big rabbis, these guys, that you hear them on a recording. They were not even Shomer Shabbat, they're telling jokes, stupid jokes in the, in the shiurim. When I sometimes hear a part of it, sometimes people send me a clip, I recognize the voice. I know where he is today in Yeshiva, already finished almost the whole Shas, this. I remember what a clown he was and what he became now. This is an unbelievable satisfaction. So when sometimes I used to come, I wanted to teach them something that is not aggressive. After five, ten minutes, Azov, Arav, Azov, leave it, Rabbi, we're not interested in this topic. Tell lanu p'tzatzot. Give us punches to the face. We need to repent. We don't need litufim. Ah, mutzi putzi, Hashem loves you. We don't want these things. Give us p'tzatzot. I said, no, but let's, I give you p'tzatzot, but p'tzatzot mean bombs. Explode the bombs in our face. I give you p'tzatzot almost every week. Let's do today a different shiur. No, no, it's not productive. We need to be shaken from the life here in the lousy queens. You can hear it on a video that they ask me. Azov, Akvod Arab, Zalo Man. Tell us p'tzatzot. The p'tzatzot made them what they are today. Almost all of them there are ba'alei tshuva. Almost all of them. I, I don't think there's even one that stay in Chalel Shabbat. Why? The p'tzatzot helps. That's what helps. That's what take a person that is zero knowledge on the street, smoking like a bum at 1 a.m. with some goyim on the street or some other Jews like him, and take him into, in few months, and turn him into a Ben Torah. So the Rambam says, I'm reading to you the words of the Rambam. ללמד האמת שבאה עליו מופת, אלא בשיעות לאחד מעולה. It will fit one superb Jew. ולא יעות לעשרת אלפים שכלים. It will not be for 10,000 fools. אני בוחר לאומרו לעצמו. I choose to say the truth to that one. 
ולא ארגיש בגנות העם הרב ההוא And I can care less what the ten thousand fools think or say. Complain, oh, too aggressive, too scary, it's not for me. I can care less what they say. ולא ארגיש, I don't even pay attention. בגנות העם הרב ההוא, וארצה להציל המעולה האחד, I will put all my effort to save the one. ממה שנשקע בו, getting him out from the hole that he sunk into. ואורה מבוכתו עד שישלם וירפא. I will show him the right path until I get him out of his confusion and cure him. The one, the one, we're not going by quantity, we're going by quality. So what do we see, Rabotai? Conclusion. החכם הגאון הזה, הנ"ל, מדעת קונוי שיש בו, שברא כל העולם להביא צדיק אחד, השם קריאה את כל העולם, for the one צדיק even, ולא חס על כמה רשעים ובהמה רבה שיהיו בו, השם has, for every million people, he has one צדיק on this earth. Million people walking on the street in a level of animals. Eat and drink and have intimacy. Whatever they see, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. Striving for pleasure, money, greed, power, aggravation, aggression, whatever you want to call it. And all of a sudden, one tzaddik. I'm bold. Put all his life into holiness. God-fearing person. One million wicked. Another one, another million wicked. What? How can Hashem stand such a world? One good and one million wicked? That's the ratio? Yeah. Who cares about quantity? This one is a whole world for me. Hashem doesn't care about all the wicked and all the people that behave like behemoth. כי זה כל האדם, כל העולם לא נברא אלא לצוות לזה. Whole world was created for that one. And how do we learn it from the words of רבי שמעון בר יוחאי? רבי שמעון בר יוחאי. When רבי שמעון בר יוחאי came out of the cave after 13 years, he saw someone plowing the ground. Not Mechalel Shabbat. No, he didn't see a gay walking in a gay parade. He didn't see some thief in Wall Street, or a trader politician, or a lefty Bernie Sanders, the lousy Bernie. He didn't see this kind of monsters. He saw a religious Jew, a farmer, who plowed the ground and picked up tomatoes. He was so angry at him, he gave him a look, and he killed him on a spot from his holiness. Hashem took him back to the cave for one more year to cool him off. This was after 12 years in a cave, learning the whole Kabbalah with the, with the angel. Why? The world could not exist in his standards. He was in such a high level, he couldn't believe that there are Jews wasting their time working in a, in a farm. Instead of learning Torah, you have diamonds on the shelf and you're running to, 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 to play with toilet paper? How can it be? How can you be that stupid? Imagine if you would see a gay parade. <laughs> I don't know, I would get a heart attack. But then he said to his son, you should know it's worth it for Hashem to maintain the whole world just for me and you. Knowing there are millions and tens and hundreds of millions of wicked people who have zero connection to him, betray him, ungrateful to him. For the one or two Bnei Torah, that's the level of a Ben Torah. The rabbi, they have to, it says in the Torah also, they have to uh, sweat by the brow. They have to also go to the food also. No? The Gemara brings this question. The Gemara says, what's the right way for a person? To learn all the time or to learn and walk? There's no third opinion to walk. There is to learn full time or half a day to learn, half a day to walk. 
The Rambam, 900 years ago, he described a balabait. You know what balabait means? A working man. How many hours he work and how many hours he learn? Three hours he works and the rest of the time he learn all the time. The Rambam testified that people in his days, which is almost 900 years ago, that were working people were learning minimum nine hours a day. Almost like a Bachur Yeshiva today. The guys in my kollel starts in the morning, finish in the evening. 10, 11, 12 hours a day, that's it. So Balabait in the time of Rambam, after a day of work, which was three hours, right away run to learn. They make enough to live for today and run quickly to work, to learn, that's it. Now the Gemara say, some people only learn and some people learn and work. Some people try to learn, they don't work out for them, meaning full time. So the Gemara said, there are people who designed and meant just to learn. Hashem gave them the sechel and the ability to sit and learn Torah all their life. Learn Torah, teach Torah, write books, okay. Some people are not in this level, so they have to also work. So they work and they also learn. But everybody must set up time to learn Torah daily. You cannot go one day without learning Torah. Just like you don't go one day without eating. You feed your body, it's needless to say, you have to feed your soul. The problem with us is that even those of us who don't have desire to eat, we eat because we have to eat, otherwise we die. There are a few people I've met in my life that don't have ta'avat achila, that don't have desire for food. If it was up to them, they would rather not to eat. They eat because they have to. I met few like this. You can count them on two, three hands. Most of the people eat because of the delicious food they're around. If the food is not good, they won't eat, especially American kids. Go to the yeshiva, see how many kids eat in yeshiva, actually. They all go to lunch, this, sushi, that, that. What is this bill? You ask your son. What is this? Five, six hundred dollars? What are you doing? I can't eat the food in yeshiva. You go and check. The yeshiva serve good food, chicken, sometimes meat, falafel, hummus, pasta, edible. Maybe it's not five stars hotels, but you know, it's decent. Much better than what I used to eat in the army, let's put it that way. But I didn't come with high expectation. Baruch Hashem, we had what to eat and we were happy in my, in my days. These American kids that grew up here, they want to have fun. That's their motto in life. They want to have fun. That's the American say. Want to have fun. That's what they live for, for the fun. Now go and convince him that you have to eat in order for you to live and not live in order for you to eat. Try to convince them. It's, it's a little bit difficult. The more wealthy they are, the more spoiled they are. Unless their wealthy father was smart, and knew how to raise children, and he kept them very limited. Didn't give them to live life with no cheshbon. I had an uncle like this. He was very, very wealthy, but he was so humble and so down to earth. His house was very average. Car, very average. Everything by him, very average. He was worth 40 years ago, close to $100 million in Israel. It's like a billion dollars today. He had businesses, he had lots, he had malls, whatever he had. And he had the best pizza on earth. The pizza made him fortunate. People from all over the world come to eat by him. And he raised my cousins, mamash in the most simple way. They came to work. When they was off from school, they come to work in the pizza, clean, put oil in the pants very short with money, and made them all very hard-working guys. That's why they all have very good life with discipline. Then I had another cousin, and his father was also wealthy, not like this. About living fleshy life, 
gave his son everything, 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 and a poor guy, nothing came out of him. Today he has nothing. Why is it? The way you raise your children, it will reflect to how they, they live their life. If they have everything with no cheshbon, credit card everywhere, you destroy them. You think you're doing them a favor? You wait, you're gonna cry for it. When they'll be married with their own children, you're gonna cry for it. And there are already thousands of families who cry for that. Some of them I warn personally. Many of them I warn not to put kids in public school. Those who didn't hear paid the price big time. All of them, no exception. They all pay the price. Their kids either reshaim, chalalei Shabbat, some of them gay, some of them drug addicts, some of them are nasty people, some of them speak, you don't even, you can't believe they're Jewish. Some of them, they grew up with the maid. Their parents barely had a minute for them. They speak with the accent of the maid. They don't have Jewish accent, Bakhlan. How would you believe? Now this guy has to get married. Nobody would believe he's Jewish, Bakhlan. What kind of an accent you have? You're born in Jamaica? It's not a Jewish accent. I mean, no offense to Jamaican people. Doesn't matter, it could be Chinese accent, whatever the accent was, but it's not a Jewish accent. We make a lot of mistakes, and mistakes are costful. We pay massive prices for it. Remember, one word, one year. One day, one year. Sometimes Hashem is very strict. So let's conclude, time ran out. So Rav Chaim Shmulevitz says that in the, in the words of Rabbeinu Yonah, Chazal say, Masechet Sanhedrin, page 100. Adagot mezikot meod laguf. Being worried make a devastating damage to the body. Blood pressure, sugar, cholesterol, fatigue, vision problem, bad smell, teeth that are not strong, losing hair, hair become white, panic attack, anxiety attack, massive stress, sweat in the hands, back pain, stomach issues, constant constipation or diarrhea, and many, many hundreds of other diseases. How many people die from heart attack because of financial issues? They had 100 million, they just lost 20 in a bad deal, and he, and he gets a heart attack. Why don't you focus on the aid you still have, more than most people in the world? Because his, his broken heart is for the 20 he just lost. He gets a heart attack and dies. <laughs> Being worried makes devastating damage to the body. Diseases are coming from being worried. As it's written in the Gemara, Sanhedrin Kuf, Sanhedrin page 100. Lo tiol dave belibrach, de gavri giborin katal dave. Translation, do not let worry enter your heart, because this, this worry destroyed many heroes. Heroes. Wealthy, strong, powerful, supposedly athletic, healthy people. What destroys them is constantly worry. Vechen katav Rabbeinu Yonah, Rabbeinu Yonah on Pirkei Avot, chapter 2. This is what he wrote. Deagat nechasim mekatsrim yamav shel adam. People that worry about money all the time lose years of life. Supposed to live to 90, you'll die 80. Supposed to live to 80, you'll die 70. <sighs> but there is one worry that extend your life. When you worry about one specific thing, it makes your life longer. Who knows what? 
דאגת תלמוד, דאגת תלמוד, דאגת התורה, מעריכים לא ימיו, מעריכה לא ימיו. When you, when you constantly, your mind is to understand the Torah, the sugiah, the gemara, you're breaking your head, it doesn't give you rest. You didn't eat for, for a whole day. Chazoni sometimes three days didn't eat and didn't sleep until he got the point of the gemara. Couldn't sleep, couldn't focus on anything else. Ma'arichim lo yamav. Ve'erich bazer rabenu b'chaye t'chilat parashat ki tisa, another legend. almost a thousand years ago, רבנו בחיי, שהדאגה והיראה מחלישים כוח האדם. A person that fear people, fear the government, fear the Arabs, fear financial losses, fear people that owe him money, maybe they won't pay. Take away all his energy, bring him fatigue. All the time he wants to fall asleep. He sits down on a couch, immediately falls asleep. בדרך הטבע ומקרבים ימי מיטתו, he dies much faster. And this is what King Solomon wrote in משלי Proverbs. This is what he write. יראת השם תוסיף ימים. Fear from God, extend your life. ושנות רשעים תקצורנה. But the wicked people who don't have fear from God, Because of their lifestyle, it shortened their life. Clear verse in the Tanakh. You don't need to listen to me. The rabbi, the sages wrote, La'atid lavo, the future to come, a person will be sued by Hashem for lack of faith that they had. Because of the lack of faith, they had all these concerns and worry. Not only for being worried, they're going to be judged. You're going to be punished for the sicknesses you got, because that's the laws of nature. When the brain worry, when the brain worry, the body does not function correctly in hundreds of different fields. You know, I want to tell you something. Before I came here, I went to the dentist. I have a friend dentist here, Tzadik, Dr. Isakov in Kisena, very great dentist, Mamash a legend. So before he gives me the shot, he shakes the, 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 the lips very, very fast. It's, he does it so good, you know, shot, it's a needle and it goes deep into the gums, it's supposed to hurt. I've been by other dentists in my life. He does it in such a way that I, don't, I didn't even know if the needle went in yet or no. That's how good he does it. Don't feel anything. Nothing, not even a pinch. Today I asked him, how do you do it? I mean, I don't understand. What's the connection of shaking the gums, the skin, like this, to the pain of needle going into my gums? I mean, it's a very painful thing to, to shoot such a needle into the gums. He told me the way the brain works, this is what they teach in, medical, in uh, dental school. The way the brain works is when the brain is focusing on one specific pain and a bigger trauma occurred in the same time, the brain cannot focus on two traumas right now. It cannot. It can only choose from which trauma, which one of the two is more urgent and more massive. And that's all he can focus on. So when I shake the gums like this, the brain gets confused. Wow, someone is attacking the gums. Immediately, he switched the pain that he sent to the gum from the needle and focused on the gum. And the pain is gone. This is such an amazing message for life. Think about it. When a person constantly worry, 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 if you learn Torah, immediately you break your head to understand the Gemara. You don't care about anything. Your back doesn't hurt, your stomach. The Gemara says, You have massive headache, learn Torah. 
חש בביטנו, יעסוק בתורה, חש בעיניו, יעסוק בתורה, whatever you have, learn תורה, אורי, learn תורה. What is the connection? There is a connection. You have pain, migraine, wow, Rabbi, my head explode. Once you begin to learn five, ten minutes, Gemara, you don't have any headache. No back pain, no knee pain, no nothing. No root canal. You learn, the brain doesn't send pain. Because the brain is focused on breaking the head now. You don't believe? I'll give you a proof. Rav Ovadia Yosef Zatzal had to have a surgery. Surgery. He asked the doctor, you're about to give me anesthesia. How long I will be numbed, sleeping, meaning full sleep? He told him four hours. And he asked him, but how long the surgery will take? He told him an hour and a half. He said, I don't want to sleep for hours for an hour and a half procedure. I don't want to lose two and a half hours of my life. The doctor said, there's no shorter than four hours. This is this, 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 the smallest dosage. Four hours is sleep. Nothing I can do about it. So he told him, so I would like you to perform the surgery without anesthesia. The doctor said, Rabbi, are you out of your mind? I have to cut your stomach open, have a, a, a blade. I make a whole cut, we put stuff into your stomach and we begin to move things there. You gotta open your skin, few, few inches of a cut and then sew it. You know the pain you may have. He told him, don't worry, just give me five minutes. <coughs> I'm gonna start learning the Gemara deep. After you see that I'm not aware of what's happening around in the room anymore, you can do whatever you want to me. I won't feel anything. This is on you. So yeah, 100%. They performed the operation on him while he was learning Mara. He didn't even feel nothing. Cut his stomach open, push stuff inside. Nothing whatsoever. And if you're still not convinced, one time he was in his room learning, and who came in? Bibi Netanyahu, prime minister with three bodyguards and walkie-talkie radio. They got them into the room, his grandson. Saba, Rosh HaMemshala Po, the Prime Minister is here. He was in the Gemara like this. <laughs> Netanyahu was standing one step from him. It's on video, you can see this video. He thought, it will take five seconds, ten seconds. I mean, how long the rabbi is gonna make me stand here? <laughs> Prime Minister. But he was in a different world. The grandfather, the grandson kept saying, Abba, Grandpa, Saba, Rosh Hashem Shalapo, Ubali Rototcha, I can't see you. He's in a different world. After, I don't know, two, three, four minutes, check on the video. It was a long, long time and very awkward. Because the, the, the bodyguards are saying to Netanyahu, what's going on here? He doesn't know what to do. It's a very embarrassing moment. It was almost as embarrassing as Bennett coming to Sleepy Joe for a meeting <laughs> and speak five minutes to the walls because Sleepy Joe was snoring. Do you remember that moment or no? Yes. Why Hashem did it to this Rasha Merusha, to this trader, why? Because he's looking for so much honor and acknowledgement all the time. He's willing to burn Israel in flame just for his name. So he, for him, it was the key moment of his life, meaning he was the President of the United States after he became a Prime Minister by cheating all his voters. He cheated them and moved everything to the left. It was a big scam, the biggest scam in Israel politics. So he's standing in front of supposedly the king of the world, Sleepy Joe, and he snores for five minutes, he talks to the world. You can see that video. Ah, the most embarrassing moment, imagine the whole world. Photographers taking picture. Mr. President, that is the United States, and he's like, <laughs> it was almost as embarrassing as this moment. So Netanyahu standing over there. Once the grandpa scream in his ear, Saba! Oh, Baruch Abba, Baruch Abba. He wasn't aware that he's there. This is just to show you how the brain works. I saw, a, I saw a, a, a proof today with my own, with myself. 
How he shakes like this, gives the shot, you don't feel nothing, not even a pinch. Sometimes with kids that they're afraid of needles, you can do the same tricks with them. Say, so, well, look what's over here, oh, well, what's over here, you smack them like this. In the meantime, the needle went in and out, they didn't even feel it. Why? Because you hit them like this on the leg. Why? This is the way the brain is. By the way, there is a doctor called Dr. Sarna. He has seminars, very successful. He wrote a few books about back pain, how to get rid of lower back pain. Surgery didn't help, nothing helped. How you get rid of back pain? You speak to the brain. You tell your brain you have nothing to worry about. Why are you sending pain? So that, that's another very interesting way to calm the brain down. Once you reprogram your brain, because whatever the brain hears, that's what he understands. It's like another person sitting inside you and receiving orders. You tell the brain, why are you sending pain to the back? The back is perfectly fine. All the discs are aligned. Spine is strong. I'm a young guy. I'm athletic. Why are you sending pain? You should relax. There's nothing wrong with the pain. Two, three weeks like this, you talk every day to your brain. Pain is gone. So you see that the brain chooses if to send pain or not. So all you have to do is to trick the brain by speaking to him. It's like psychology. I want to tell you something. Did you ever wonder to yourself how the psychologists are fooling millions of people every month in the world, making billions of dollars, and nobody catch the scam? What psychology? I'll tell you what it is. You come to the psychologist, hello doctor, good morning, good afternoon. Tov, last session, we spoke about your childhood when you were in class in the eighth grade. Remember that guy John, he reads from his man. John punched you in front of everyone and he wanted to respond and this and they threw you out of school. Okay, let's hear what else happened that day. You talk and talk and talk, 20 minutes. Okay, now let's talk about your brother and sister. You say that your brother and sister are giving you our time, talk, another 20 minutes you talk and it's over. Okay, our time is up. We will meet on Thursday. What was the whole se session? You spoke 43 minutes, the psychologist spoke a minute and a half. And you pay $600, whatever. What is this scam? The answer is not a scam, it's written in King Solomon. King Solomon already wrote the entire psychology in one verse. The entire psychology in one verse. No wonder he was the smartest person ever lived. Say so you have some concern in your mind? Yasichena. The Gemara speaks about what does it mean Yasichena. Yasichena can be written with a shin, sin. You put the dot on the left. And it can also be written with a samich, a circle, Yasichena. What's the difference? If you write it with the sheen, it's good. If you write it with the sheen, it's Yasichena, will speak to someone about his concern. If you write it with the sin, with the samech, yasichena min yasiach da'ato. Thank you. Yasiach da'ato. Will push it away from his mind. Will push it away from his mind. Either one is 100% correct. When a person come and speak to the rabbi about his problem, for 20 minutes he let it out, the rabbi didn't do anything. And he say, Rabbi, you saved my life. Wow, thank you, I will never forget what you did for me. What did I do for you? I just let you talk 20 minutes. And in the end, oh, 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 I, I can cure your problem, I can find you shidduch, no. But as soon as he got it out of his chest, he's already feeling so much better. That's called Yasichena Leacher, the Gemara Speak to someone you count on, someone reliable, someone that is not going to take advantage on you. That's already half of the problem is gone. 
Yasichena means push it away from your mind. How do you push it away from your mind? You make your mind busy with something else. I give you an example. If now you have something that bothers you very much, someone gave you a check and the check bounced, and you already suspected that this guy is not 100% kosher. It's a large check. You're very worried now. But your friend said to you, come on, we have to start learning. You came to Yeshiva, you have chivuta. How long will it take for you to forget about the pain you have about the check? Exactly a minute. As soon as you begin to read a few lines in the Gemara, you begin to read Rashi or Tosfot right away, you forget about the check. For how long? Three hours. You're happy. Wow, what a Gemara, it's so interesting. When the check is going to come back to your mind, as soon as you close the Gemara and get up. What's the first thing right away come? The check. Now you have to run and run and chase that person. So you see from the time that he was distracted from your mind, you were busy with something else, that worry doesn't exist, that concern. It doesn't exist. What happens if you learn like the Chazonish, non-stop, all the time? You never have one problem in your life. Nothing. You live very long life. In case you are wondering, did you ask yourself how come all the big chief rabbis live to a hundred and up? Almost all of them. Rav Steinemann, 101. Rav Eliashiv, 101. Rav Wozner, over a hundred. Uh, uh, Rav uh, Kaduri, 105. Rav Shach, 107. Rav Kareli, it's almost a hundred. Rav Ovadia, 93. Rav Chaim Kanievsky, also 90 something. Every one of Gdolei Ador, Sfaradim, Ashkenazim, Hasidim, almost a hundred and up. Isn't that uh, not normal? Statistically. You had 10 or 15 biggest rabbis in the world. Almost all of them passed a hundred. What does it show you? It's no coincidence. People that their mind is non-stop in learning, their brain function, when the brain is sharp, the entire body function better. You know, you have a, you have a Rolls Royce. You pay three, four hundred thousand dollars on a car, and today all cars have computer. How much the computer cost? Three thousand dollars? Let's see if you have to replay, reprogram your computer or to replace the computer of the car. It's few chips that manage the transmission, manage the shocks, manage the, the electric in a car, the stereo system, the airbags. Everything in the end is the computer. I remember I once bought one of the most lousiest cars in the world, Honda Odyssey. Disaster. Every day something else breaks. The mechanic told me, Baruch Hashem, for 20 years my parnasa came from Fort Torres. <laughs> now Fort Torres, Allah wa Shalom, Allah ir chamo, the God read of it. <laughs> now, <laughs> Hashem send us on the other seat. There's now one part in the car I did not replace. No joke. Even the two sliding doors I had to replace. They came out of the truck. One time, the car was one year old. One car, no, one time I drive it. And I see, every time I get to like 25 or 30, the car is beginning to vibrate, <laughs> like this. How can it be? It's a brand new car. I say, what's going on? Brand new car, not even 20,000 miles. What's going on? A few weeks later, I get a letter by the mail. If you have under the sea, please, there is a recall. You have to come to the Hyundai dealer if you feel that your car vibrates when you go from first gear to second gear. Please bring your car to the Honda dealer for a procedure that will take 20 minutes. I said, that's exactly what I have. I go to the car dealer, he said to me, 20 minutes. I said, what are you doing? He said, we reprogram the computer. Connect to cable, to the car, reprogram the computer, the car drives like Mercedes after that. The problems continue, ah, but at least it drove smooth. What happened? Something in the electronic there. It will decide if, uh, in this case, it's a, it's a cheap car, but let's say you have a Bugatti, $3 million car. This lousy $2,000 computer control every part of the car. 
It's not a physical problem. It's not a hardware problem. It's a software. You have a little virus in your laptop, $3,000 laptop, tiny virus, makes the laptop unable to work. Same thing, your computer in your head. If your computer is rusty, is not being used, is only used for sport and other nonsense all day, by the time you're 70, you act like a three years old child. Make me tea, why nobody come to see me? I see people, people talk to me. The older you get, the dumber you become. That's what the Gemara says, it's not my opinion. The Gemara says, The more, the older you get when you're an ignorant Jew, the older you get, the dumber you become. Tell me, the chachamim, it's like wine. The older you get, the smartest you be, the smarter you become. Rabbi, from what age it goes downgrade? What age you consider old? 70. I had a Syrian uh, friend. He used to be 72 at the time that I one time went to eat with him in a restaurant. He said to me, can you do me a favor? Can you do me a favor? Why you keep saying 70 years old? I'm 72, I feel like a teenager. I play tennis, I jog, I run on a treadmill. You, you, you take away my desire to live. Can you raise the age to 80? I said, I did not decide when you become old. The Gemara said, Ben Shivim Lazikna. The Ariya Kadosh says 60. 60 is when you become, you are starting to become old. Starting to become old. That's a manafkamina la'alacha. According to the Ari, if a 60 years old man comes into the room, you have to rise. According to the Alacha, if a 70 years old coming in, 70 and up, you have to rise. Do you understand? Meaning you have to give respect to the old. So, let's conclude, Rabotai. We learned a lot of interesting stuff today. But we learned a few good, very important tricks. First, you have no permission to worry because when you worry, it makes you look older. It makes you not function. It changes your behavior. It makes you die younger. All of this we learned today with proofs. Proofs from Gemara, proofs from Rambam, proofs from uh, King Solomon. So what's the most important thing is to elevate our emuna. Almost every problem you have in life, the reason, the source for your problem is lack of faith and confidence in Hashem. Jealousy, that's the source. Greed, that's the source. Pride, that's the source. Stinginess, that's the source. Laziness, that's the source. Over, being over aggressive and arrogant, that's the source. Being a bad husband, that's the source. Being a bad wife, that's the source. Everything is the source. Because once you know, you're all in Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. It's everything Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. That's it. You know the Chazonish had a rule in his life. What was his rule? He never tried more than twice. If he tries something and fail, he will give it only one more chance. If second time it didn't work out, he will never try the third time. Once I asked, who said that it's a good idea? I can bring you a proof from people that are salespeople that they only made the self after 10 times bothering the customer. You know the people in a cash advance? They call you 500 times, in the end they close you on a million dollar loan. That's how they make the annual income, on one big deal. When you ask them, what made you close such a deal? This guy was so not interested in taking the money. You say, I did not let him breathe. Every day, text, calling, this, all kinds of tricks, tactics, coming, calling him again, sending him text. Boom! Until he said, you know what, let's do it. What got me the deal? Consistence. Being a nudnik. If I was the Chazonish, I wouldn't close one deal in cash advance. I try, Mr. 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 Harry, 
You want a loan? No, I'm good. Don't call me ag again. Okay, you call the next week. Mr. Harry, no, what about that loan? You want it? I told you don't call. Next time you call, I'll send my son to kill you. The next day, Harry, you come down. Let's do some business. In the end, he signed up with you. It's reality. That's how they make their business. Not only them, all kinds of salespeople. Same thing, people that connect donation. They have people that, you know, they have, you know, all these babot that dress in all kinds of clothes. They have a group of soldiers who solicitate for them. They check what kind of watch you have. They follow what kind of car you have. They check with others if they know you, what's your job, what's your business, where do you live. And after they realize that you have, uh, Baruch Hashem, you have fat cow, they can get some good milk from you. They send the team to target you. The Rav needs to talk to you. What does he want from me? You don't say to the Rav. You don't say no. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. is waiting for you. Oh, listen, tomorrow it's still a walk. Come on, when the Rabbi call you, you come. It's a whole, uh, a whole system, smooth. The right recruiters. One time, two times, you avoid them once, you avoid them twice, then they show up, you have a problem, oh, the rabbi is in the car, he asks if he can come in. In the end, he gets the million dollar out of you. What happens if you offer him 10,000? He'll be very insulted. For that, he's not even bending down. Man, that is such a holy man, you're offering him 10? You're crazy? That's how it works. That's Consistency, psychological pressure, making you feel guilty, making you feel wicked. Most people are ignorant, most people are naive, most people judge the speaker or the rabbi by their external look. They don't know that every Arab sheikh who doesn't know how to read and write can make himself look like some baba. And as results of the look, they are all very... <laughs> Fascinated. And then they go to break that they are the right hand man of this Baba. And in the end, it's all a lie and it's all a deceiving and all take advantage on people. It's very sad. So the question that I have right now, I gave an example that the Chazonish didn't try more than twice. Try once, second times doesn't work. That's it. That means they're offering you a girl for shiduch. The girl is not interested. You call the shatchan, did she agree? No. You wait a week, you call again. Can you ask her maybe she would reconsider? She said no. I'll never try with her again, ever. If you're the chazonish, two times. Someone else, try three, four, five. Fifth time she agree, and they got married. No, Hashem, they have a nice family. Everything worked out. So you're asking, if I was like the Chazonish, I would still be single. The fact that I tried five times, in the end, got me such a great wife. True or false? Reality-wise, true or false? Reality is true. Reality looks like true, but it's completely false. No, how do we explain such a contradiction? Listen carefully. When Hashem knows that you have confidence in Him, you're like in the level of the Chazonish, you already set up the rules for Hashem. By me, you have to give me what you want to give me in maximum two attempts, because there won't be a third attempt. You know me. I try once, doesn't work, I try second time. By the second time, I will never try the third time. So if Hashem wants you to marry this girl, he will have to agree, she will have to agree first or second time the latest, that's it. So you'll get everything you need to get very fast, without concern, without efforts, without killing yourself. Same thing with customers. I want to sell you a car, would you agree? No, no, not right now. You call next week, you agree? No, that's it. If Hashem wants you to sell him the car, it has to happen in maximum two times. But when you are a loser, that you have zero emuna in Hashem, and you only believe in your aggression and talent, Hashem knows who you are. 
And he will know you call 50 times, so he plays with you. Later he will show you what kind of a loser you are. He had to call 50 times until you sold the watch. Shame on you, where was your confidence? That's what happened to Yosef Atzadik. First time he asked Sarah Mashkim, when you go to Paro, remind him that I'm here, I'm sitting here for 10 years for nothing. I'm innocent. No problem. First time everyone is allowed to try to get out of jail, especially when he's innocent. Why did Hashem give him two more years? Extended his staying in jail for two more years. Because he said it for the second time. Once he said it for the second time, he got punished for the first and the second time. Meaning, yes, right now you made a sale, but one day you will be punished for it because you, Hashem will hold you responsible for not having a munah in him. This was the whole shiur about today. I showed you proofs. Yaakov Avinu lost 33 years of his life. Few years of them is because Paro spoke. You want to punish me for my complaint, for every word came out of my mouth, you give me one year, you're shortening my life for one year. I understand. But why do I have to be punished for Paro is asking me how old I am? That's, that's on him, that's not on me. No, it's on you. Because you worry, you look very old. You look that you are 200 years old. Of course he's going to ask you, why you look so old? How old are you, Grandpa? How old are you? No, no, I'm not such an old man. I'm only, I'm only 130. My life was bad. Because you made Paro ask you, how old are you? Because you look terrible, because you have no emunah in me. This is what Rav Chaim Shmuelevich brought with some proofs. Because people had to ask you, why you look so bad? Why you look so tired? Why you look so depressed? Why your eyes are like this? Why you, your hair became all white? All day I'm worried, all day I'm suffering, this, what happened? My daughter, my son, this, my wife, my husband. That concern kills you from inside. And when people address that, the way, the way you look bad, or you look old, or you look sick, Hashem is holding you responsible for that. Any questions before we finish? Yes. Yeah. The situation with the Supreme Court, can we say in Gamsmetorah? When the people attack the Torah, when people attack the Torah, it's 100% our fault. Why do you think Hashem let 15 wicked judges kidnap Israel and control 3 million Shomrei Torah mitzvot, or 2.5 million? Do you know why? Because we allow them. We allow them. If the religious people would really care that they fight Torah and that they're pro-gays and they're pro-Hilul Shabbat and they're pro-Hamas, and they hate yeshivot, and they want everything that Hashem hates. If we would be righteous, two and a half million people with yarmulke on their heads would go to the Supreme Court, surround it, and say we won't move out of here for months until Israel become a Jewish state. If we have to get rid of you, we'll get rid of you. But you're not gonna make Israel dictatorship of wicked people. They will have to surrender. Remember, it's not only religious people who suffer. Traditional suffer. Every righty suffer. Even some of the mild lefties don't like what they do. Think about it. Basically, every decision they ever made is anti-God. Every decision. Here in the United States, thanks to President Trump, he nominated three judges that turned everything to the positive side, if you can call it positive. Meaning it's not as wicked as it used to be. Because now the majority is Republicans, and Republicans are anti-abortion, anti-gay, anti-Hamas, anti-Iran. So they are at least more logical. Again, they're not righteous, they're still the corruption, but it's not as wicked. It's already something. 
We have to choose very wicked and small wicked, you choose the small wicked. You don't want the big ones. Any more questions? So it is our fault that we have this? It's 100% our fault. So a person, uh, a person didn't put fill in. You ask him, what did you do? He said, Gamza Tova. No, it's not. You understand the difference or not? Whatever is decree from Shammai, decree from Shammai, it's not in my hand. My action can cause it. But right now when Hashem punish, Gamzu Tova. By the way, everything that happened with the Supreme Court, it's written in a Zohar. Be'acharit ha'yamim ishletu ba'aretz tse'et tse'ei ha'erev rav. They will take over Israel. It's written, it's a prophecy. So if it's a prophecy, how, how can we override it? Can we, override we can, no. Every bad prophecy doesn't have to happen. If, if I was able to do two, three million ba'ale tshuva, they wouldn't happen. Think about it. If we had five, six million Shomrei Shabbat in Israel, they wouldn't dare to behave like this. The majority of the people in Israel would be Shomrei Shabbat. We have to do something. Remember, Pinchas did something, he changed everything around. Until Pinchas did it, do you know how many Jews died? 24,000. If Pinchas wouldn't do what he did, who knows, maybe another 50,000 would die. And Hashem said, Pinchas is my favorite. Why? He got up and did something. He's a zealous. All you need is one, uh, one Jew that would say, enough is enough. I'm going to sacrifice my life and put an end to it. And does something crazy, and I will be the beginning of the revolutions. Until now, four years they abuse us. Nobody makes a beep. Not only that, the religious people in the Knesset, they kiss, you know what, kiss up to them. They kiss up to them. They try to find favors in the eyes of the lefties. Because remember, they control the courts, they control the prosecution, they control the, the, the every courtroom, they control the media. So a lot of losers, it doesn't matter they have a beard and a black hat, it doesn't make you righteous. They want to be in peace with them, with the wicked. Why? Don't target me. Don't target me. Don't send me investigators. Don't make terrible articles about me in the media. Don't sue me. Don't jail me. I'm good with you. I'm kissing up to you. But the Torah said the exact opposite. Someone that kissed up to the Rasha, no fell beyadav. It's just a matter of time until Hashem will arrange that he will fall in the hands of that Rasha. And if not, it's going to fall in his hand, it will fall in the hands of his children. That's what Chazad said. Ah, they, they are the dumbest, this Neture Karta. A bunch of fools. Is such a damage. You have to understand, they hated Zionic, the Zionists, because of what they did in Israel. They turned Israel to a wicked state. They see Tel Aviv, they see what happened to all the people. But as one thing you hate Zionism, it's one thing you hate the wicked government, it's one thing you hate the Israeli army because the rules are rules of goyim. But who gave you permission to join Nazis that wants to murder all Jews and help them and promote their agenda? One has nothing to do with the other. I also hate the Zionim. I also hate the communists. I also hate the lefty wicked people who hate Hashem. I also hate the gay parade and the gay marriage and the other corruption. I hate that. But if I'm going to have to now support Hamas who wants to murder them, I will not do such thing. I rather make them Baalei Tshuva. And if they're not Baalei Tshuva, let Hashem take care of them. It's his business right now. We do what we can. We try to bring the light out to the world, the light of the Torah. But to join Hamas, to pray, to read Tehillim for Arafat, they're out of their mind. In the end, they get millions of dollars. That's the bottom line. The end will fall in the hands of the right? Their end will be the worst. Because every second by them is Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem is a very big thing. The Chilul Hashem that they do, that Iran use them to justify them wants to kill all Jews, in the end they're going to have to pay for every Jew that died, and for every soldier that died, and for every piece of land we lost and for making Hamas stronger, and for making Iran more legit, because Iran is using them. And they're going to have to pay for all the damages that came from their actions. 
Yes. I, want you, I want you to know they're not such reliable to their agenda and ideology. It's all business. They get millions of dollars. When they came to the office of Arafat in Machshimo, they found tons of canceled checks that he wrote to them. Millions of dollars they were getting. You think that they come there in Manhattan and they scream, free Palestine, and they go on Shabbat even. On Shabbat they go next to the microphone and scream. They go on the Brooklyn Bridge on Shabbat. Who gave you permission to go from one room to the other? Mechalelei Shabbat. The answer is when they make millions of dollars, they forget Hashem for a day or two here and there. This is the corruption of Neture Karta. More questions? Aruch Hashem. Thank you very much. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia Omer. Ratsa, Kadosh Baruch Hu Lezakot et Yisrael. Lefichach, Herba Lahem Torah ומצוות. שנאמר אדוני